Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the uh, June 8, 2016 uh, meeting of the PDC Board of Commissioners. Uh, Gina, would you please call the roll? Chair Kelly? Here. Commissioner Cruz? Here. Commissioner Dixon? Here. Commissioner Edlin? Absent. Commissioner Myers? Here. Commissioner reports. Uh, let's uh, start with Commissioner Cruz. All right, I have a few things this time, so if you bear with me, I will, uh, if I can find it, I'll run through my list. Of course, I can't, but I've been to um, a few different events lately. I went to the um, Equity Council uh, meeting here at the PDC uh, this last month. That was very informative. It was very interesting to see how that uh, program is working. Um, I also went to a program at the uh, at Portland State University the other night, a uh, celebration of the future development of their Graduate School of Business, or excuse me, Graduate School of Education building uh, project. And so that was quite interesting as well. And then uh, with my other hats on, I had various meetings um, as chair of the Hispanic Chamber and as president of the Northwest District Association. So, Thank you. Uh, next, Commissioner Dixon. Yes, I get one more one more meeting as Commissioner Dixon here. Um, so I what I actually attended um, an event that Commissioner Edlin put on called Welcome Home Coalition. It was on May 11th, and um, it was a really well attended event. It's, it's basically you know trying to work on solutions for um, ensuring that we provide um, affordable and safe housing for um, all of Portland residents and so he actually hosted an event at his office that day and I also attended the um, Black United Fund luncheon on May 25th and I know PDC um, we sponsored um, that event and so uh, presented a scholarship to one of the um, students that was receiving scholarships at that fund that that day so thank you thank you Commissioner Meyer so I attended the Portland Youth Builders Open House and the Oregon Trades Women, uh, Women in the Trades Fair. So it was uh, two very uh, important events in the city that uh, helped with workforce development. Thank you. So let's see, on the 11th I went to a budget hearing. Um, on the 16th we had a financial sustainability meeting. I think that same day, another uh, trip down to City Hall for the budget, um, which was relatively um, uncontroversial, and, and we heard quite a few nice things about uh, Patrick uh, from the commissioners, so I sort of decided I needed to start getting used to that. <laughs> um, and they even acknowledged the fact that um, I wasn't paid. I thought that was pretty special. Um, so uh, then, then uh, on Saturday we had a nice event that Sons of Haiti, the, the basic ribbon cutting and Patrick and I were there and um, was able to say a few words and I slipped up at the end of my talk and said some more nice things about Patrick. So, you know, uh, it's, it's getting, yeah. It'll be over today. It's going to be over today, yeah, <laughs> thankfully. So, with that, Patrick, your report. Thank you, Chair Kelly. Good afternoon, Commissioners, uh, for my last Executive Director report. And I'm actually going to keep it brief because we, uh, you know, we have this big agenda today, and um, I know um, uh, we want to make sure we leave plenty of time for all the items on the uh, that we have uh, to cover. So, um, and you know, this is an example of the the great work that um, Sean Ullman and his team do every every month they prepare uh, a summary for me talking points of all the events that happen and typically I would I'd be able to read through but I, I won't be able to do it today but uh, but there's a lot going on the commissioners covered a bunch of it uh, but but the great work of PDC um, um, goes on every month um, what I do want to spend my few minutes uh, on right now is to both say goodbye to two more employees and to welcome a new one, which is nice. Nice to, you know, we've been doing a lot of goodbyes lately, but um, I'm going to start with, with the woman right in the middle, Robin Rafferty, who 
Um, as I shared, uh, we had an all staff meeting. She was the first person I met when, when I was interviewed at PDC. She came downstairs and, and greeted me and, and led me to my interview panel. Um, but Robin has been with the organization for, um, for 13 years. So it would be 13 years in September. So we're not gonna exactly hit it, but we'll, we'll, we'll round up. Um, and, and Robin has, has served in a variety of roles uh, uh, within the organization, um, primarily, uh, and, and when I met her and, and worked alongside Robin, she was in what we used to call our development department and it became our urban development department, but, it, but the department where, where the, um, most of the redevelopment worked happened um, uh, in the agency and did that for a, a long time. And then, um, uh, and then Robin moved to the prof our professional services team um, uh, where she served in as an administrative supervisor, operations coordinator, and then as a senior project program coordinator in professional services. Um, so we've, we, uh, Robin's last day is next week, the 16th. We've already had our party for Robin and had a good time, but uh, we're gonna miss Robin and, uh, and uh, uh, we wish her well. She's, she took our early retirement package and I think she's actually going to retire. So that's, Congratulations on that. So thank you, Robin. Sitting to Robin's right is Peter Englander. Uh, Peter is also leaving the organization as a result of our early retirement program. Peter's been with the organization 15 years. Um, and Peter worked in the development department with Robin and me as well. And, and, uh, and Peter, most recently, Peter's been working on uh, and he's led our op Opportunities Cooperative team, which has really been looking at the long-term financial sustainability organization, thinking about new resource opportunities. But, but much of his time, Peter spent here working on a whole range of, of projects, um, projects that, that, that I think a lot of people would recognize. Peter started out on the lending, on the lending side of the organization, did business loans, um, as well as commercial real estate loans. And one of his signature projects was what we, ref what was called the Holman Building, but it's the River East Building, we could, River. So if you go down to where Viewpoint Construction is, the boathouse is in that building, but it really um, was one of the first East Side projects that, that, that kind of captured everything that, that we try and do as an organization, physical redevelopment, job creation, one of the fastest growing companies ended up locating there, but then we also provided public amenities um, for, for the public so to access the, the, the watercraft users had, finally had a home to access the river. And then Peter moved on um, after that to work, to work within the Central City team on, and the, in the development department, the number of projects, but, but much of his work was really concentrated here in Old Town, so all the projects you see, you see in Old Town, the U of O, Mercy Corps, OCOM, the, 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 the new fire station right there by the Skidmore Fountain, and then of course the new um, um, Saturday Market Home. Those were all projects that Peter worked on during his, during his time here. Um, and then he worked on some projects that didn't happen. If, you're been, if you spend a lot of time at PDC, you'll, you'll have your own projects that, don't, that never happen, but the work is still the same, and Peter spent a lot of time trying to get a renovation um, of the that Veterans Memorial Coliseum through, that then council didn't ultimately take action on that. And he spent a lot of time on next door here on Block 33, which we were at one point was hoping gonna be in a Wajimaya development anchored by a Wajimaya grocery store. That didn't happen. But those things will eventually happen. That's what we're, that's what I'm reflecting on these days as the PDC eventually will get around to, to finding a way to get these projects done. But I've really appreciated Peter's work over the past couple of years on this resource development, financial sustainability work. It's been thankless work. It doesn't result in any immediate payoff, but it's, it really is uh, work that's vital for the long-term health of the organization. So I appreciate him stepping up and leading that, that team. Um, so best of luck, Peter, on, on whatever you do next, and thanks for your many years of service to the organization. I'll just ch ch chime in on that. I've worked with Peter on this financial sustainability, and uh, he's he's done a great job and and really made a contribution. So thank you. And we'll hear Peter and I will actually get a chance to present that to you, so you can see the results of of that work. And then we get to welcome Karen Harris here, who's um, taking over as our uh, paralegal and loan closer in our legal department. 
Um, uh, and so I'm just meeting Karen for the first time today. <laughs> so, so I said, you don't need to remember my name. I can forget. There's other people. Uh, but, but Karen, um, she was just, we, we came down here together. We were ch chatting. She's been uh, in the, uh, doing this work for 35 years, she said, um, as a paralegal for a variety of law firms, um, Schwabi Williamson, Cable Houston, Green Markley. Um, she told me she grew up in Portland. She went to the same high school that my kids go to. She went to Grant. You're a Lincoln guy, right? So go yep. Grant. Go Generals. Go Cardinals. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, our previous uh, paralegal closer, Christine Sale, who was with us for a long time, uh, was a uh, was a big dog lover, and there's something about the position because I guess Karen is a big dog lover as well. So you'll fit perfectly into the position. So welcome aboard, and best of luck. Um, and I'll check in and see how things are going. But that's my report for now, uh, and uh, I'll save my other remarks for later. <laughs> okay, uh, the meeting minutes for January 27th and March 9th. I take a motion to approve. So moved. We have a motion and a second. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. The motion carries. Doesn't look like we have anybody here for public comment. Is that right? Um, so we're going to move to a, a regular agenda item number six, which is the election of officers. And I would like a, to make a motion to nominate Tom Kelly as chair of PDC, um, to nominate Gustavo Cruz as vice chair, and to nominate Mark Edlin as treasurer. I have a second? A second. second. Pardon me? Secretary. Oh, sorry. Oh. Secretary. Okay. okay. So nominate Mark Edlin as secretary. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. The ayes have it. The motion carries. Um, now we have item number seven, adopting the budget amendment number three for the fiscal year beginning in 2015. Mr. Barnes. Good afternoon, Chair Kelly, Commissioners, Executive Director Quinn. I'm Tony Barnes, Budget Officer. I'll be presenting today uh, Resolution 7187 before you, which is uh, the third and final budget amendment for this fiscal year, for fiscal year 1516. Um, so, as part of our annual budget development and management process, we present this final budget amendment, usually around this time of the year, to really do two things reconcile project amounts between uh, what's happening this fiscal year and next fiscal year. Uh, what's in the approved budget for 1617, but also identify any final areas where appropriation is needed to avoid any uh, potential for overexpenditure as of June 30th. So as uh, detailed in Exhibit A of your packet, changes are specific by funding source, by URA and other funding sources, and in some cases required increases, but mostly uh, these represent decreases on a fund-by-fund -fund basis uh, that already have been incorporated into next year's budget. So a quick uh, review of the changes in resources. There's, a, there's just a few changes. Um, we uh, moved over $90,000, and the city already reappropriated $90,000 for uh, general fund funding for bridging the tech divide, which will be included in next year's budget. Uh, and then also we have a slight change to uh, debt proceeds. That's our interim line of credit for River District funding uh, based on River District projects based on timing again. Um, and then also we have a slight increase in property income related to, I think this is mainly the Headwaters Apartments, which we uh, PDC manage on behalf of PHB. So there was higher um, occupancy rates accounting for. So in total, uh, the total year-end estimate for resources is about $400 million, $404 million. Um, this was largely made up over half by the beginning fund balance of cash at the beginning of the fiscal year, but also um, it shows $100 million in debt proceeds. So that's a short-term and long-term debt that have um, been received by PDC across the different urban renewal areas. Uh, property income was significant this year uh, with sales of multiple properties planned, but not all those transactions have been finalized yet. So some of these might slide into next fiscal year as well. 
On the requirements side, the expenditures, as I previously mentioned, these are detailed in Exhibit A, it includes the fund by fund detailed budget appropriation categories. Um, rolling up all the changes, it's about a $10.6 million reduction across the funding sources. This is uh, mostly as a result of the $6.7 million from PHB's estimate. These dollars have already been included in next year's budget for PHB and our uh, tax increment districts. Um, mostly an interstate and convention center and downtown waterfront. And these dollars are all tied to existing um, awarded projects. It's just a matter of construction timing. Um, administration is increasing only to adjust appropriation categories. It's a technical change. You'll see a decrease in debt service and um, an equal, almost an equal increase in administration. It's recategorization of payment. It's really a pass-through from PDC to the city's Office of Management Finance for interim financing payments. You'll see this also in our recommended changes for the adopted budget um, later this afternoon, where uh, because the debt's not held by PDC, it's not a liability on our, our balance sheet, uh, we're classing, classing, classifying this as an administrative expense um, since it's not tied to any of the other existing appropriation categories. So at this point, um, there's about $583,000 budgeted. We probably won't incur that expense since it's a, a higher interest rate that's budgeted than what's actually being um, um, accrued right now. In total, other uh, infrastructure, redevelopment, economic development projects. Uh, there are some changes in um, the redevelopment category where we're bringing dollars into this fiscal year from next fiscal year for acquisition of the post office site. It's a little bit higher this year than uh, what you'll see, uh, what we originally had in, in, in the revised two budget earlier this year. Uh, but that's offset by decreases in lents for the town center projects, which have moved to next fiscal year. So it's a net decrease of 1.6 for property redevelopment. So in total, for expenditures, we we're forecasting on the budget side about $154 million in expenditures. Um, this is largely, again, property redevelopment projects. There are some things that have not been moved out of this year's budget that might not spend. For example, the biggest example is uh, the Multnomah County grant, about $17 million. The IGA is through December to uh, transfer those funds to the county when they've reached certain milestones. So we anticipate those dollars not actually going out this year. Again, one of those items that will slide into next year's budget when we do budget revision number one. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to take any questions on the on the revision. That concludes the presentation. Yeah. Sounds like we've all been briefed well. So um, do we have a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we adopt resolution 7185. <laughs> second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Item number eight, um, authorizing the executive director to execute the collective bargaining agreement between the Portland Development Commission and the American Federation of County Municipal Employees. We have uh, a number of uh, people here today representing uh, management and the union. We have Eric I Iverson, Jill Joe Balin, Jeff Fish, I, was there an intergovernmental agreement to get him here today? <laughs> uh, just wondering. Uh, hey, 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 Justin Douglas on the union side, uh, Amy Fleck Rosette, hey, Allison Wicks, Robert Smith, and Rob Wheaton from the union. Just thank you, uh, all of you, for your efforts in this. Well, thank you. Um, Chair Kelly, Commissioners, Executive De Director uh, Quinton, is that your name, Quinton? <laughs> um, we're Oops. pleased uh, to be come before you today to um, present for your approval uh, uh, the, the fourth three-year collective bargain agreement that we've had for this organization um, between PDC and the American Federation of Sta State, County, and Municipal Employees, AFSCME. I'm Eric Iverson, General Counsel of PDC. And I'm Amy fleck -Rosetti. I'm a senior project program coordinator here at PDC and our um, AFSCME Local 3769 president. Thank you. So Amy and I will soon go over some of the key details and um, primary parts of this new collective bargaining agreement, but I wanted to start by expressing my, 
profound appreciation for the work of this group here, the, the, the amount of time and effort and thoughtfulness they put into this. Um, this negotiation was exceptional. It was the smoothest and shortest of any negotiations we've ever had. Um, four months seems like a long time, but much shorter than the previous ones. And uh, Rob mentioned when in early May when we all stood up and shook hands on reaching agreement on the final uh, term of the agreement, uh, Rob mentioned that he was about to leave for another negotiation that started the same time ours did and still had months to go. I don't know if it's still complete. <laughs> It's still going, <laughs> but I, but part but primarily it was I attribute that to the thoughtfulness, seriousness, intelligence of everybody on both teams and their ability to both um, assertively express the issues that were concerned to them, but also thoughtfully listen and seriously listen to the opposing uh, points of view. And it was it was truly a pleasure. Uh, Amy will introduce later her in more detail the specific, uh, her particular team members, but I wanted to particularly give credit to Jeff Fish, who led this effort just marvelously. I think, um, I, I will note, however, that the deal didn't get finalized until four days after he left, <laughs> so I don't know that that was a coincidence or not, but Jeff, <laughs> but Jeff, Jeff was spectacular. I mean, he, um, he obviously is very experienced in this area. He kept us all together on point, and he kind of set the tone for everyone I also want to thank Gina Bieland, who was a member of the team, Justin Douglas, who was a member of the team, uh, Selena Colson, who unfortunately can't be here today because she's out getting her wedding license this afternoon, uh, which I think is more important than recognition here, but they were all just marvelous. Um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Amy. Yeah, I would like to introduce um, our team members. We have Robert Smith, Allison Wicks, and also Rob Wheaton, our AFSME rep. And I'm gonna provide additional recognition at the end, but we'd like to kind of discuss some of the highlights and some of the key changes to the new collective bargaining agreement. So first we'll start out, um, PDC contracted with MLB Group and conducted a classification compensation study. And that class comp study informed the new job classifications and pay ranges outlined in the new contract. A number of the job classifications have been consolidated and increased to bring uh, job classifications to market. Uh, in addition, we also, with the CBA, adopted a new, new parental leave policy uh, that'll provide six weeks of paid leave uh, to members that qualify. Uh, this policy is consistent with the city of Portland's uh, current policy on parental leave. Um, then I also wanted to just note quickly the, the economic terms um, that we have this year. Um, this, this year the compensation will be largely moving people to the new salary grades and to the extent that that movement does not result in a 3.5% increase, those that in the move get have less than that, they will get a lump sum equaling 3.5%. So that's year one. In years two and three, there will be a 1.5% cost of living increase um, and there will also be a 3.5% uh, um, step increase for every employee that has a fully successful or above performance evaluation. Um, we went through a long process going through this, but it's, it's, I think it's, it's fair. It's within budget in very tough times, and um, I, th those are the, the key economic terms. Um, I'll also note that we have uh, new provisions in there to discuss with manage manager approval um, pursuing uh, uh, telework in certain circumstances, particularly in the situation we have right now, for example, with the seismic upgrade, we're looking at and experimenting with different ways to, to get our jobs done in the most efficient and effective manner. So I would just like to close by recognizing both of our teams and thanking everyone for their efforts in finalizing the collective bargaining agreement. I'm personally very proud of our work and dedication um, of our PDC professional community. So I'd just like to recognize again Robert Smith, Allison Wicks, and Rob Wheaton. Um, they're an amazing team of folks to work with. And I'd also like to thank Eric Iverson, Gina, Justin, and most of all, our HR staff, Selena, Colson, and Jeff Fish. And although Jeff is no longer here at PDC, I'm so glad that he was able to be with us today to celebrate this accomplishment. 
Thank you, Jeff, for your leadership while working on this contract and the previous CBA. We really appreciate it, so thank you. So if you have any questions, we are happy to answer them. Um, no, but I would just say congratulations. I know it's a huge project, so well done. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Myers? No questions, but again, I'd like to echo what uh, Commissioner Cruz says, and good job at getting a, a contract that's agreeable to both. Thank you. I, I third that. Um, I remember <laughs> when times weren't as great, and to be able to see everyone, oops, sorry, to be able to see everyone working together and having it be such a collaborative um, discussion and, and resolution is, is very commendable, and it's promising. It's a really um, nice end to my last time here, so I, I really appreciate all the efforts all of you guys put in this together. Maybe I should get a few of you to uh, get involved in the negotiations we're doing with the carpenters and you can help finish it <laughs> off. <laughs> Actually, we, it seems to be a good negotiation. So thank you very much and for everybody's good work. And it's, of course, wonderful to have a, a happy group here presenting a, a new contract. So I think with that, I would uh, take a motion. So moved. And second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you. Congrats. We get a bill from the school district. I want to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we need to break, right? Um, are we moving along too fast? Yeah. Should we move something ahead? Okay. <coughs> yeah, I mean, as long as it's all effective in that order, then yeah. Can we move the consent agenda for we're, we're discussing whether or not those items are contingent on the approval of the budget. So pass it on consent agenda conditioned upon approval of Okay. So was that for items eleven and twelve? All right. So um, the chair would entertain a motion on the consent agenda. So moved. We second. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. The motion carries. <laughs> so can we carry forward item number 10, which is the budget? We already did that. I think we should, I mean, I, we also have, so we have people scheduled to come at different times in the day, so you don't, you don't, we don't want to get too far ahead of. All right, we'll uh, take a break until uh, 1.45 and uh, we can convene the uh, the uh, budget meeting.
Welcome. The Portland Development Commission will now recess in order to convene the Tax Supervising Con uh, Conservation Commission public hearing on the PDC fiscal year 2016-17 approved budget. And I just want to say welcome to everyone. Um, You're back. I know, but you have the script. Yes. Are we ready to get going? Mm -hmm. Okay. PDC is pleased to participate in today's TSCC hearing on the PDC budget. Over the last six months, staff, stakeholders, the PDC board members, and most recently, City Council have weighed in on the 2016-17 budget putting forward key urban renewal area project, project budget decisions, which include complete acquisition of the U.S. Postal Service site in the River District, construction of the Convention Center Hotel parking garage, implementation of the Lentz Town Center projects, implementation of the Halsey-Weidler investment strategy, and the construction of Bond Avenue in North McAdam. The board and council also moved forward on a general fund package from the city that incorporated targeted 5% cuts, preserving funding for PDC's priority programs around inclusive entrepreneurship, small business development, and the neighborhood prosperity and workforce development. The general fund budget also established new one-time funding for strengthening East Portland business associations through Venture Portland, assisting the Living Coley Partners with an important redevelopment and the kick off the Portland Benefit Corporation B Corp program that will assist companies uh, to become certified to meet rigorous standards of social and environmental performance, accountability, and transparency. PDC's operating budget in the approved budget included 92 positions. However, staff will be presenting later this afternoon a final recommended budget for an adoption that includes 86 positions following the implementation of PDC's early rent retirement incentive program. As we'll be discussing in more depth later, PDC is moving closer to the sunset of active urban renewal areas and has recognized the limitations of TIF to move forward critical components of the PDC strategic plan. Over the last year, PDC formed a financial sustainability committee that has made recommendations to staff for the formation of a new business plan with the, which the board will be receiving later this afternoon. While not fully incorporated into 2016-17 budget and five-year forecast before you, the plan will serve as a foundation for future budgets and long-term financial plans. So I think uh, I hand it over to you. Great, thank you. <clears throat> With that, I'll turn it over to Craig for a discussion. Thank you. So we have we spent um, quite a bit of time looking over your budget. Um, and we're familiar with it to begin with. Um, clearly, this budget reflects change. And the changes that, that I picked out of the environment that you are in is unprecedented area growth, a housing crisis, oh, yeah. um, okay. development that needs to be reemphasized in a couple of areas, um, opportunity, the acquisition of the old post office site, um, sunsetting to the, some of the areas, and some administrative changes, You're changing personnel at the board level and staff level. Um, so this is a changing environment, and the new number of 86 positions next year is, just makes more change. Um, so how are these changes reflected in this budget? Well, the budget increases housing allocation to $70 million. That's triple what it was two years ago. Um, the budget for property development is $172 million, which is six-fold over what it was two years ago. Um, general fund spending drops by 10%. Unusual in this, in this period to have any entity drop its general fund. And staffing continues to decrease. I had down here a third of all positions have been cut in the last four years, um, but now it becomes more than a third. So. So PDC is operating in a changed environment, and this budget reflects that changed environment. Um, and the last key piece we found is that PDC's Financial Stability Committee 
has been working to address exactly those issues, um, the future of PDC and its funding. Um, so that's what we found as we looked over the budget. The budget itself was put together normally. The numbers look good. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that during the certification process. I guess the meeting hasn't been called to order yet. It's not been, okay. not been called to order, but. Okay, all right, I'll do that now. All right, order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll call to order the annual uh, Portland Development Commission budget hearing. Uh, my name is David Berenger, and I'm the chair of the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission, and I welcome you to this hearing. I'll now ask my fellow commissioners and the TSCC staff to introduce themselves. Fargo right. Norton, I'm, uh, this is my first term as TSCC commissioner. James Offsink, also my first term. Thanks for having us. Uh, Brendan Watkins, commissioner, uh, third term. Gulgan Mercero, commissioner. Uh, Craig Gibbons, executive director. Metro staff. And do any of the commissioners have business relationships with the district that could be perceived as a conflict of interest? I work at a law firm that represents PDC on bond-related matters. I don't believe it rises to a conflict, but I'd like the record to reflect that relationship. Great. Thank you. We are conducting this hearing as a service to the district and the public, and the purpose of this hearing is to promote public discussion of the budget. The Commission wants this discussion to promote thoughtful consideration of current and future budget issues. The Commission is responsible for evaluating the district's budget process. At the conclusion of this meeting, we will certify the degree to which the district's process conform to the Oregon local budget law. The district, will make the, well, the district has already made their presentation, and then we'll begin by asking several questions and discuss the budget with you. Following the testimony, we will take uh, testimony, the following discussion will take testimony from the public, and there is a sign-up sheet in the back of the room for anyone. Right here. Okay, right there, if anyone wishes to speak later. Um, have you had a chance to introduce yourselves yet? Let's go ahead and okay. do that. Okay, go ahead, thank you. Uh, Gustavo Cruz, uh, Commissioner, uh, first term. Mark Edlund, Commissioner. <coughs> William Myers, Commissioner. Anushka Dixon, Commissioner. And Tom Kelly, Chair of the Commission. Great, thank you very much. Um, with that, I think we'll start our, our questions. And I have the first one. <clears throat> the access to debt backed by tax increment financing, TIF, which is the predominant source of revenue for the PDC, is being severely limited. And the situation is, is getting worse. In six years, debt may only be available in, in just two of your URAs, Central East Side and North McAdam. What are you doing today to prepare for that time when the debt proceeds backed by the TIF will no longer fuel the PDC's economic development efforts as well as administrative operations? I think that one's mine. <clears throat> Thank you. PDC 2015 through 20 strategic plan requires new and different funding to be the driving force for widespread economic prosperity. These resources must be more flexible than tax increment financing, which limit PDC's ability to implement its strategic priorities. If PDC is to maintain its leadership role in helping Portland grow with widely shared prosperity, new approaches to investment are necessary to ensure long-term financial sustainability, including a sustainable balance between the financial risk and financial returns. The PDC board at its April 2015 meeting directed PDC staff to convene a financial sustainability committee to provide advice on the development of a business plan to guide PDC's transition to long-term financial sustainability. The committee met four times in 2015 and reviewed information provided by staff and PDC consultant HR and aid advisors. The FSC reviewed best practices of other development finance agencies <clears throat> and considered new revenue from public, local and federal, philanthropic and private sources which were all evaluated based upon their potential impact and feasibility. At the end of this review, the FSC put forward recommendations to PDC staff for structuring a business plan to support the agency's strategic direction that would optimize both public benefits and financial return on the remaining TIF funds, clarify the guidelines for, converse, for conversion of TIF funded assets to unrestricted funds, use the agency's real estate portfolio as a basis for creating a long-term revenue stream for the agency, pursue acquisition and development of properties and the redevelopment of other public-owned properties, use new TIF, TIF districts in a limited project-specific manner to provide ongoing capital funding to catalytic public and private projects, focus on boomerang revenue stream to the City of Portland to partially offset the loss of TIF funds, 
seek to maximize fee revenue to the agency. At its May, two, May 16, 2016 meeting, the FSC recommended the PC staff request that the PC board approve amendments to the agency's financial investment policy to start guiding investment decisions before the agency experiences further depletion of assets. The amendments to the financial investment policy would explicitly direct staff and the Financial Investment Committee's review and recommendation of financial transactions to the executive director to more strongly balance the long-term financial return considerations with mission-driven public benefits. Due to the expected reduced availability of project capital directly controlled by PDC, the updated policy also directs more focus on a higher attraction of third-party funds. Finally, there are additional directions to address preservation of capital through more fiscally stringent grant and infrastructure decision making and forthright and transparent treatment of loans that upfront are expected to be forgiven and thus grants that also ties these decisions to other grant making decisions. We forward a copy of the business plan to you that incorporates these recommendations, which staff will be reviewing later today. Great, thank you very much. Brendan? <clears throat> Excuse me. So as a matter of policy, City Council has increased the percentage of TIF revenues uh, for housing from 30 to 45 percent. Um, and as uh, Craig uh, discussed earlier, uh, that was a, was a threefold increase over uh, several years ago. Um, can you identify the other projects that uh, may have been canceled or delayed due to uh, the new allocation? This one's mine. <laughs> Uh, the change in the affordable housing set-aside policy will result in the increase of funding available to the Portland Housing Bureau both in the near term and over the life of the open URA districts, but will not cause PDC to cancel or delay any project commitments. All planned reductions to PDC resources will occur after the fiscal year 16-17 budget and five-year forecast and effectively reduces PDC's ability to invest in commercial development opportunities and other community priorities in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marco? <coughs> Thank you. The budget contains some interim financing from the city of Portland to allow you to proceed with the postal office project, um, which is featured rather prominently in reports about your activities as recently as the past weekend. Can you tell me about um, kind of an update on that project and both what you're looking for in the short term as well as the long term for that site? This so one's mine as well. PDC is acquiring the U.S. Postal Service property pursuant to recommendations in the city's long-range Central City 2035 plan, as well as a Broadway Corridor framework plan, both adopted by City Council. The U.S. Postal Service is currently finalizing due diligence to confirm construction of the replacement facility. Uh, excuse me. Uh, to, concern what, to confirm whether construction of the re replacement facility fits within the established project budget. Following confirmation of project costs and budget, PDC will acquire the existing site in the summer of 2016. PDC will work on behalf of the city to redevelop the property in alignment with the proposed density, public benefits, and development approach that are outlined in the framework plan. In the short term, PDC will undertake master planning of the site, coordinating related public involvement, and working with key city bureau partners, including the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and the Portland Housing Bureau on the rezoning, affordable housing, and infrastructure requirements for the site. Over the longer term, with completion of this work, together with the U.S. Postal Service's construction and relocation of their facilities, the PDC will pursue property redevelopment and disposition. Thank you. In addition to hearing a lot about the post office building, we hear a lot about the so we therefore have a lot of questions for you about that and your involvement with the garage. We understand about $30 million from this budget will be used to build the garage. Can you tell us about who else is contributing to the garage, if anything, if anyone, um, who's going to own and operate it and how the operating revenues will be used? Dave. This one belongs to me. So <laughs> the total estimated cost. The total estimated cost is currently, uh, as budgeted, $30.6 million. 
we are selling approximately 15,000 square feet and 50 um, of the secured parking stalls on the ground, or 50, 15,000 square feet on the ground floor and 50 of the secured parking stalls to TriMet for 7.6 million, which brings down our cost uh, to 23 million. Um, who will own and operate the garage? PDC will. Um, will own the garage and is we are entering into a parking and valet service agreement with, um, with Hyatt for the garage operations. Um, and then how, how will revenues received um, from the operating of the garage will be uh, all garage revenues net of expenses will flow back to PDC, including all the valet revenue that Hyatt receives from guests utilizing the valet service. Um, parking revenues together with refinancing of the garage at stabilization are anticipated to pay back uh, the URA investment and uh, allowing resources to be reinvested into the convention center URA and the Rose Quarter. So that's part, that will be part of then the plan to make sure that funds are less restricted, is basically, that, like those parking revenues will become a portion of um, less restricted funds that PDC will use in the future? Once the debt is paid off to the Oregon Convention Center URA, then, then yeah, the, the, the the revenue, surplus revenue from the garage will, could be used for other purposes. Do we have a sense of what that looks like? It's long, it's, it's how long until we pay off the, it's, uh, the debt? Uh, yeah, so, so once debt's paid off on the garage, it's a, if it's a it's fully owned garage without any debt, there, there would be, what's the annual rep, they've got different people on them, what? The net without debt, like if the debt's paid off, Ten years from now. Yeah, so. it's a it's a it's a high yielding garage because of the valet contract. Uh -huh. So it's not a standard structure parking in that, that at least according to projections, I think ninety percent of the garage will be utilized by Hyatt. So it's just parked at a much higher rate. But um, but so so that's the the financial benefit to the agency is that. Great, thank you. So in 2016-17, uh, the majority, or 9.5 million of the $15 million special levy is allocated to the Oregon Convention Center URA. Can you talk to us a little bit about the special projects um, or project that this money is earmarked for? Yes, I'd love to do that. Um, the special levy is used along with the capped amount of tax increment to repay outstanding bonds in the Oregon Convention Center URA. Final bonds in the district were issued in 2012 and they'll be repaid by 2025. Proceeds from the final bond sales have been spent on affordable housing and remaining proceeds are programmed for the Convention Center Hotel contribution and the Convention Center Hotel Garage. The current five-year forecast anticipates proceeds from TriMet for use of portion of the garage and a future refinancing. Proceeds from these sources will be reinvested into the Rose Order. Do you have any specific plans with regard to the Rose Quarter? Specific projects? We do, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that was our question. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think there is, there continues to be conversations about the future of the Rose Quarter, which includes the future of the Coliseum. Um, we're, you know, we're generally taking we'll take our lead from from the city in that regard but um uh i mean i think the conversation's still you know kind of at this visioning conceptual level we don't see anything concrete yet that we could that we would say is an actual project but there's development parcels truly really not trying to be evasive there's development parcels right now um that 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 front broadway and 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 those are could be near term Opportunities. There's um, uh, there's kind of a more significant reconfiguration of the Rose Quarter that people have talked about. That that would be a much bigger uh, redevelopment project, require a lot more resources, and then you can even expand the footprint to cross Broadway and think about the properties there, and, and including the PPS's headquarters, the Blanchard Building. So, so all this continues to be part of the conversation, but none of it crystallizes into anything. Um, and um, and with regard to the near-term development opportunities, um, we get different 
feedback from, from stakeholders about whether to move on those or to hold so that we can do it as a grand vision. Um, so even those, I'm not sure that there's anything in the near term that we would pursue. The, the other way I would think about it is um, the post office site, we will, you know, we, if we you know, close on the deal and then the post office moves out in two years, we have 14 acres, that's kind of a, the next 10 year big opportunity. We have places like South Waterfront, other places that are, that are building out. You can think of the Rose Quarter as the 20 year opportunity, right? So, so the city doesn't have the ability to move on these big redevelopment sites um, all at once. So they will happen in that stage. And, and if you imagine the Rose Court, I mean, the, the post office and that Union Station area redeveloping and becoming more dense and more active, you're just a five minute walk across the bridge. So then it, it, it actually creates more of a d demand for what could happen at the Rose Quarter. So I think that's more likely to be the sequencing as well. I, we're all impatient probably to see more of the Rose Quarter. But my guess is that's that's the likely sequencing of development there. So that's way out then in the, yeah, in the financial forecast. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Marco? <clears throat> Under the city's larger affordable housing strategy, funds are now being transferred from PDC to the Housing Bureau. Are you, are you just passive in that transfer or do you have the ability to um, influence how those funds are used? Um, currently, PDC does not make or directly influence affordable housing investment decisions for the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, however, the PDC and PHB work very closely together co-investing in mixed-use projects. Examples of that include Parcel 3 in South Waterfront and the Lentz Town Center projects. Establishing and implementing community action plans, so we work collaboratively with those plans as well, the Old Town Chinatown, the Lentz Gateway Action Plans, and the Powell and Division Community Development Action Plans. And including representatives of each bureau in the selection committees to review proposals or to make hiring decisions. So we work very collaboratively. We don't make direct um, decisions in, in regards to affordable housing decisions. Um, with Mr. Quinton's uh, resignation, what are the ways that the PDC is planning to prepare for the transition in leadership? Thank you. That one comes back to me. Uh, the PDC Board of Commissioners, which is responsible for hiring the PDC Executive Director, has appointed current uh, PDC CFO Faye Brown to serve as Interim Executive Director effective June 9th, tomorrow, 2016, until such time as the PDC Board appo appoints a permanent Executive Director. In order to ensure an open, transparent search for the next Executive Director, the PDC Board directed staff to contract with executive search firm McDermott and Bull, who is currently in the process of conducting a national search for qualified, interested candidates. It is anticipated that approximately 14 member interview committee will interview a list of candidates in late June and early July and make a recommendation of a short list of several candidates to the P PDC board to consider. At this rate, it is anticipated that the new executive director will be appointed by, PDC, by the PDC board in early September. Thank you. Does that mean today's your last day, Mr. Quinn? Uh, yes, it is. Oh, no. oh wow. Okay. I, I wanted one more TSCC here. <laughs> oh, thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> sure. Go ahead. So um, I apologize if this is a little remedial, but hopefully you can give me a bit of a civics lesson. Can you t talk to me about the role of the public in the PDC's decision-making process? Um, that wasn't a prepared question, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, it varies. So, so you know, generally speaking, any project we do has we build in public input, and and so it's more of a matter of kind of what that looks like. Projects of significant scale would have not only a much more uh, more involved public input process, but it would, would would try to have a broader reach. And we, you know, in, you know the post office is front and center ahead, so I can use it as example when we think about who the public is for that project, we need to think citywide, right? Because it's not just about the people who live in the Pearl. But when we 
think about the projects that should go in Lens Town Center, we really are talking about the, the, the Lens community and kind of the outer southeast community. So, so part of that's part of the calculation is, is what's the definition of community. But then projects will have, you know, they'll have stakeholder advisory committees, we'll have a series of, of kind of public open houses. We, we've actually um, begun to use more frequently online tools. So we have something that we call um, it, uh, online town hall. Um, so you can, so in certain projects, you can go to our website and for 30, 45 days, we allow for, for kind of open, open um, input. Um, the, and then we have two standing um, uh, advisory committees. One is called our Neighborhood Economic Development Leadership Group, and they are they they meet regularly to discuss the priorities for our neighborhood work. Uh, uh, so anything outside of the central city, and that is both priorities around programs and 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 that, but also they take a look at our budget. And then we have a central city committee that basically does the same for for the central city. Um, for our central city work, but, but basically our central city urban renewal areas. Um, and, and those are, those groups consist of, you know, re what we think is are, are representative stakeholders from, from all the areas um, that we do our work. Um, but it's, it's, it continues to evolve in, in the post office that when we did the Broadway framework corridor plan, which was the, the Broadway corridor framework plan was um, the, the, the the first conversation about the vision for this post office site and, and the area around it, and that document went to council. We did a kind of a normal advisory committee, but then we also hired another firm with the specific goal of reaching populations that aren't that don't typically show up. Yeah. And and uh, and that firm um, was particularly trying to trying to reach out to communities of color and other folks, particularly geographically away from the central city. And, and get their input on not just the project itself, because that might not be, they might, but, but also the idea is, you know, public space. What, what type of public space would make you, would feel welcoming to you? Um, and so that's a tool that I think we'll continue to use more frequently so that we're not listening to the same people every time and, or just the, the knowledge class, if you will, who are, who are, you know, really up to speed on everything and have an advantage in, 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 in stakeholder processes. Um, so if I could refocus, that's really helpful. And I feel like a part, an important part of the public input process is having the right people. And it sounds like you're really invested in trying to get a diverse mix of people who reflect the city. Um, the other side of it to me is, you know, how much input or how, how much effect did that input have on the final decision? So this is kind of just a, you know, subjective question. Do you feel like you're getting um, helpful and useful feedback with that public input process, and does it have an effect on the ultimate decision? I mean, I, I don't. I mean, the, the board would should, should weigh in on this. I For think sure. the answer is yes. I mean, you know, obviously you're weighing different perspectives, so oftentimes they're irreconcilable, right. and you're talking about matters that often get, get into financial constraints, and so there's 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 desires that we hear from the public that we can't possibly fund or are feasible. Right. So, so with you know, setting that aside, I do. I think you know, to the extent that we can be responsive to what we hear in the public process, but that, that's what we'll do. I mean, we don't. We're not. We're not in this just to in, kind of implement our own agendas. It really is about. I think but, good, good example is Centennial Mills, yeah. uh, where we had people come in here and talk about uh, wanting to save, you know, some of the buildings there, and we were responsive to that. Yeah. I will say it's amazing that these meetings, since I've been on the commission, how few people do come to this commission directly. And so the There's alternative a, outreach is really important. There's an opportunity at every meeting for the public to comment about it. And we, we get some amount, but, but surprisingly few people actually. And On the other hand, at, uh, at some of the meetings for the projects, you know, we'll get a lot of people show up to those. And we do. So if it's like the, the gateway action plan mm -hmm. that Commissioner Dixon referenced, uh, that's an information, and so we bring the, the, the open house is, is in gateway, right? It's, it's in the community. And we and so we try to to make sure that we are we're where it's it's accessible for people to uh, to participate so they don't have to come downtown to in order to share their input. So. And they also um, just something that we receive a lot is just letters or notices that people send and they say pass this on to commissioners and so quite frankly the public whenever they want they have direct access to us and. I mean, I literally read the majority of any letters that people from the public send um, to us. So I, I think there is a really 
a good amount of access and we pay attention to what the public says to us. I probably get one phone call a week from somebody who wants to talk to the chair of the commission about something. Oftentimes it has nothing to do with what we do. But. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. We're listening. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you all for your contributions to this discussion. Uh, I will now ask if there are man any members of the public who wish to speak. No one has signed up. Okay. Um, with no other speakers, I will now close this hearing. And thank you again for taking the time to uh, prepare such good answers to our questions. Uh, the meeting is now, the hearing is now closed. Um, with that, I'll open up a regular meeting of the TSCC. Uh, are, do any commissioners have any comments on the budget? No? With that, I'll ask the executive director to review any staff recommendations. We have uh, one recommendation and it regards expenditures in the 14-15 budget that exceeded the authorized budget level. These over expenditures were in three funds and totaled less than $1,000. But we will require a response um, from your finance team about how to avoid this budget law violation in the future. And although it's not a recommendation, we heartily, uh, staff heartily endorses, endorses the appointment of the interim director. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Uh, may I have a motion to authorize the commission to sign the certification letter as recommended by staff? I'll move. Okay, a second? Second. Okay, any discussion before we vote? All in favor say aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Any opposition? No? With that, I'll uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to take a, a few minute break before we reconvene the PDC. There's a lot we're getting done today. I was afraid I was going to have to.
some cream and eggs. Oh, what? Oh, fresh. Oh, nice. Okay. We will now uh, reconvene the regular PDC board meeting. Um, our next item on the agenda is the adoption of the um, annual budget of the Portland Development Commission for fiscal year beginning <coughs> July 1st, 2016 and ending June 30th, 2017. Back to the table is our own Tony Barnes. Good afternoon again, Chair Kelly, Commissioners, and last time Executive Director Quinton. Uh, I'm here to present the uh, budget adoption for 1617 recommended changes. So before you in uh, Resolution 7188, Exhibit A, are the fund by fund recommended changes for um, the uh, adoption of the budget. So City Council approved PDC's budget on uh, May 18th and changes that Council approved were primarily around the general fund uh, portion of the, the budget, so the, the citywide economic development portion. Um, in addition to um, several of the, uh, the, most of the recommended cuts the PDC put forward to meet the 5% reduction guidance from the city, um, there was an addition for $75,000 for the B Corp program and $90,000 in carryover funding for the, as I mentioned during the budget revision, the bridging the tech divide program. There's also a $211,000 grant added for Living Cully and $166,000 uh, for Venture Portland to provide extra support for business associations in North and Northeast Portland and $30,000 to ongo uh, continue um, investment in the three-year plan in Old Town Chinatown for district management, promotion, and programming. Uh, those were the council approved changes from the budget you last saw in April and today um, with C TSEC certification, the board may adopt the budget as long as changes do not exceed more than 10% of budget expenditures in that council approved budget in any one fund. Uh, there are no changes that are um, increasing any, anywhere near that, that limit, so we're not near that, um, that, uh, that uh, requirement. So changes um, that we're recommending on the resource side from the city approved budget include um, a slight adjustment down in River District beginning fund balance due to higher post office acquisition expenditures in the current year. Since we're spending a little bit more money, there's going to be less cash in the beginning balance for River District uh, next year. And then a higher forecast of property income uh, related to station, place, garage, and in the convention center. So we're truing up a couple estimates on the revenue side for those properties. Um, there's also a reduction in transfers uh, for the lower inner fund loan proceeds between River District and the Business Management Fund due to the higher post office acquisition, so similar to the beginning fund balance um, reduction. So a total resources showing of $403 million. Um, $250 million of that is beginning balance based on the revisions in the 1516 budget that I presented uh, uh, just about an hour ago. Um, about a third of that beginning balance is cash in the River District that is reserved for this final payment um, anticipated for the USPS uh, site acquisition um, in the first quarter of this year, and about $30 million for um, tied to the Convention Center Hotel Garage. So a lot of that, that beginning fund balance is reserved. Uh, TIF debt is similar to what we saw in the 15-16 total, about $100 million in short and long-term debt. But instead of being focused in River District, it's more focused towards the neighborhood URAs looking forward in Lentz and Interstate, Interstate for housing projects and Lentz for the Lentz Town Center projects. On the recommended changes for the expenditures, there's, they're fairly minor as detailed in Exhibit A. Um, the uh, property redevelopment item is a negative, a net negative of $1.2 million. That's a result of uh, mainly moving as I mentioned earlier, USPS acquisition dollars into the current fiscal year. So we're reducing the total amount next year, in next year's budget, to offset that. Um, and then also on administration, as I mentioned earlier, there's a change between debt service and administration based on the interim financing payments that we pass through for uh, the River District interim financing to be categorized as administration instead of debt service since it's not, again, a liability of PDC. Technically, it's a liability of the City of Portland. Um, one thing to note that's not 
highly visible in this, but um, is included in Exhibit A with a little bit more description, is that personnel decreased costs about a uh, net $250,000 from the proposed budget that you last saw in April. Most of that's in the general fund, a reduction of $170,000. This is related to removing six positions um, from the 92 that was in the original requested and proposed budget. So um, as the chair mentioned earlier, we're at going to be 86 positions going forward into next year. Um, and that it also incorporates the early retirement incentive program um, estimates, some one-time costs related to uh, incentive and vacation payouts. So that net $250,000 savings is, is actually um, uh, a combination of um, ongoing savings but some one-time costs that are related to the program, the incentive program. It also includes personnel um, estimates include the collective bargaining agreement that was approved earlier as well as um, updated health insurance premiums that will be effective July, I'm sorry, January 1st. Um, and all those items are uh, very close to um, what we budgeted um, earlier in the fiscal year. So in total, the adopted budget expenditures for next year are $296.4 million, um, uh, $171 million or 58% is associated with property redevelopment. But as I mentioned earlier with the resource side, uh, $82 million of this is related to the USPS acquisition. That's a combination of housing dollars and PDC dollars going into the acquisition, and $30 million uh, related to the Convention Center Hotel. Uh, that's the balance of the property redevelopment is $59 million for Lentz Town Center projects, ongoing commercial redevelopment programs, and grant programs throughout the URA districts. As you can see, uh, housing's at 75.1 million, so um, it's, it's um, an incorrect percentage on this pie chart. <laughs> but it's, it's, well over, <laughs> it's well over the, um, I think, the 30% mark. Um, and as we go forward, it's going to um, increase with a bubble in the next couple of years as the Housing Bureau brought forward a lot of dollars to um, uh, front load the additional set aside in the URAs, primarily in the interstate urban renewal area. And economic development is at $15.3 million. Uh, that's again a combination of the general fund resources and um, E-zone resources and revolving loan resources. Administration is $14.5 million. That reflects the uh, decreased personnel costs um, that I spoke of earlier. So I'd be happy to answer any questions and I will provide you with an updated graphic that is with the correct percents. Questions, commissioners? I have a question. Um, what did we budget for uh, PERS increases? So it, that's in September coming up, correct? We have, um, we're still in the uh, biennium where we have constant rates from the last change. Um, we'll know of what the new rate is for the next biennium this September. Uh, that will be effective July 1st, 20. 17, so the upcoming uh, fiscal year, uh, we'll, we'll stay tuned. We'll see um, how that uh, that looks. Right now, what we have budgeted is a is a is a is a an increase that was based on some um, analysis with the city. And so we're using the same estimates as the city is in the, the citywide estimates that's put into the five-year forecast. Questions? But I guess we'd have a motion. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye the ayes have it. Are we uh, once again moving too fast? Yeah. Right. Thank you, and thank you, Thanks, everybody. Tony. And yes. I want to thank all PDC staff for all the work throughout the. Uh, the year on the budget, Executive Director Quinton, the board, and the financial planning staff, Francis Thurman, Courtney Cohn are here, and Faye Brown. We are it's got a budget for next year. Again tomorrow. Thanks for your good work. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Congrats. You'll be back next time for the first adjustment, is that? <laughs> About October. About October, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, we uh, already disposed of the consent agenda. So our next item is number 15, an information and action item 
adopting an updated financial investment policy and process for internal review and approval of financial investments. Mr. Quentin takes a new seat. I know, it's been a long time since I've been in this position here. Um, so uh, Peter Englener and I are here to share with you the, what we're calling the 50% draft of the long-term business plan for PDC, uh, as well as bringing to you a potential action item, which is an update to the, um, to our current financial investment policy and uh, uh, adopting some of the principles that we lay out in the plan. So I'll, I'll walk through the business plan at a high level and then Peter will, will walk you through the, uh, the, uh, the, the proposed changes to the financial investment policy. Um, uh, and just to start with just a reminder, uh, we've talked about this, but anybody else who's listening, we, we're not here today to, to ask you to adopt the, 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 this 30-page this business plan uh, and all the associated schedules. We understand that this is the beginning of a conversation um, which, which hopefully over the next few years will play out with, a, with a, uh, an adopted plan for, for keeping PDC around for a long time. But the policy itself is something that we do think requires more immediate attention. So I'm going to um, kind of remind everybody of the process that we've gone through uh, to get to this point, starting with the, uh, what Commissioner Eden uh, highlighted that a year ago the board asked us to do this, and so we're back uh, reporting back on that. Walk through the plan. And in particular, I, I, want us to, I want to highlight how we are thinking about funding the current st strategic plan, which we think reflects the priorities going forward for the organization. So we're not just solving a resource issue. We're solving how do we fund the, the priorities of the agency and then talk about the timeline. Um, uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions. And we also have um, invited testimony from the, both the Financial Sustainability Committee as well as from our neighborhood economic development leadership group, which received a presentation on this. This is the process that we undertook uh, to get to this point. So a year ago, you asked us to go off and, and study this and come back with recommendations. Um, we convened a financial sustainability committee chaired by, by our own uh, chair, uh, Kelly. Uh, Commissioner Elin also served on the committee, but we invited a range of, of different um, experts, if you will, but, but, but uh, this wasn't meant to be a broad-based stakeholder committee. It was meant to be a group of people who had both experience with PDC and its financial condition, but also had experience in these matters. And so um, we, we also hired a consultant um, from California uh, to help us along the way. And so we met uh, for, about, for a four-month period, took a break, wrote the plan. We presented this plan to the committee last month. We got their re recommendations, and um, the plan you see now is, has incorporated that, um, and, and now we're here to talk about what we do next. I include this in every presentation on this topic just so we remind everybody what the issue is. The, the, our access to new resources ends um, officially in 10 years, but for the most part, as was mentioned in the previous hearing, it really ends in the next six to seven years. Um, uh, as was correctly pointed out, without addressing this, the, the, the eight-year scenario is that we're only operating in two neighborhoods in the city, which doesn't, doesn't work any better than, than, than us being out of business. So that's really, uh, the, the problem needs to be addressed um, in the near term, but the um, South Waterfront has one more opportunity to issue debt, and that's that last little bulge. And so I'm going to spend a little time on this slide. The recommendations that we've put forth in, in the draft business plan are really summarized here on this slide. And the, the recommendations, um, uh, there are really seven recommendations. And the, what you see here, they're, they're listed in the order that we think represents their sense of urgency. So if the, if the board was to do one thing, we'd start with number one. and, and um, if you're only to do two or three, we'd start with the first three and so on. Um, and, and so we really want everybody to think of it this way, which is this is how we can begin to, to address this, this, uh, this issue without having to take it on all at once. So the first issue is really how do we spend the remainder of the TIF that we have between now and our last date to issue debt? 
roughly speaking, that's about $500 million that we have to spend. So, so when we talk about running out of money and we say we have $500 million to spend, a lot of people would say, well, that's not really a, a problem. And in some sense, it is an opportunity for us to, to still, to still um, address this situation. And, and the, 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 the concept we're, we're trying to recommend here is that we, we do a better job, a more consistent job of balancing financial return with public benefits. We, we're in the business of providing benefits to the public. Uh, we think we can do that at the same time as, as, as creating a financial return, really getting resources back so that we can stay in business and, uh, and, and, and do further, further good. Um, uh, having $500 million to start with actually is a, it gives us a good head start on that. The second piece is, is at the end of life of these districts, we will have assets left over it's, there's, you, you heard a question about it in the earlier hearing about this parking garage we're build, building. At some point when the debt is paid off, that becomes an asset free of TIF. That represents an opportunity not just to, to have resources that we can recycle, but to have resources that we can use for other purposes. So money we make in the convention center district could conceivably be spent in East Portland 10 years from now, and we should begin to plan for that. The third third component to this is 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 the is the main source of new revenue is likely to be from our existing real estate portfolio, um, and when we say existing real estate portfolio, we're referring to what we own now, but the properties that are on the horizon, including the post office, that represents significant value that, if managed properly, can once again achieve public benefit, but also generate return to the agency. It requires us to take on more risk, though, with our real estate portfolio than we currently do and to put ourselves in a position of being an owner or developer more often than we are now. Um, you're going to hear about, uh, and after us, you're going to hear an example of how we're stepping into that role. But we can't just be a passive real estate owner in order for this to work. We have to, we have to actually take risk. The fourth piece is if we can do that with our own portfolio, could we not do that with other portfolios? There's other public agencies, public um, entities, starting with the city of Portland, that own significant real estate. There's within that, those portfolios are properties that have development potential. As a development entity for the city of Portland and as the largest development entity in the region, we, we are probably well positioned to take on that, uh, that role and generate both returns for the owner of the real estate, so it can return back to the other public partner, but also um, to us. And when you think about an example of that, once again, today they asked about the Rose Quarter. We don't own the Rose Quarter property. The city owns the Rose Quarter property. But we believe that if anything is going to happen there that, that results in both development and return, it's probably going to be, have to be led by PDC. Um, the fifth component is how do we use TIF in the future? If, we, if the goal is to reduce the impact right now of a renewal tax increment financing on the city, at some point we're going we're gonna to have uh, substantially achieved that and we're going to have the capacity to, to create new districts uh, and use tax increment financing as a public investment tool. We think the model for that in the future is, is more limited project-specific districts that allow us to achieve very specific outcomes in a, in a far more tightly defined geographic area. Um, and, and use tax increment to make the needed public investment to attract private investment. And this is what we see elsewhere in the United States. TIF is most often used in this, in this way. The sixth uh, piece to it is, is, uh, uh, is us going to the city and asking for additional public funding for our work. Right now, we receive about $5 million annually from, from the city of Portland, City of Portland General Fund. As, as uh, we was mentioned in the TSCC hearing, it's actually gone down slightly in the past few years as general fund has expanded. So it's not, we're not really, it's not really taking on more of, of, uh, of a role for our funding right now. We believe there's an opportunity for us to make that ask with, uh, uh, with what we call the boomerang revenue stream. Boomerang refers to the revenues that will be unlocked for the city, the county, for the schools, once urban renewal districts are retired, uh, it's estimated that by 2030, that revenue stream to the city alone will exceed $40 million annually. That's, that's money that is not currently in the long-term forecast for the city. And we believe that there's a case to be made that a portion of that, a percentage of that can be shared with PDC um, as a way to make up for the loss of tax increment financing. Um, we, we would 
the, this plan assumes that that through boomerang funding we basically double the amount of revenue that comes from the city to PDC or some or roughly ten million dollars annually and then the last piece is really maximizing fee revenue to the agency we we need to need to continue to look for opportunities to generate revenue from the activities we already do um, I uh, I highlighted the importance of our real estate portfolio. One of the concepts that we explore in the business plan that we think should be um, should be a, a way of operating for the agency is that we we operate more like an impact investment fund and view our entire real estate portfolio as one. And we seek an overall return for that portfolio. Within that portfolio, we can we can take on projects that achieve different rates of return. Um, some have more public benefit than others. But on the whole, we're still seeking a single uh, return, and in that way, we can pr we can um, uh, create a more predictable revenue stream back into the agency. But it does require us to operate differently than we do now, and as I mentioned previously, it requires us to be in an ownership role or developer role more often. And so this is what it looks like if you were to, if you kind of picture the the change in our operating revenues over the the life of this plan. You see two main sources of revenue tax increment financing, and the city's current general fund allocation basically going away, and in, and in this case, five new revenue streams taking, it, taking its place. Um, uh, and, and you can see the largest of this, which is in maroon, is, is this, the boomerang funding, but, but there's also substantial contributions from real estate, which includes both uh, regular commercial real estate and, and, um, and parking. The other thing to highlight with this graphic is the solution to our, our, our long-term revenue issue is not a single source. It's, it's actually a more diverse revenue stream. Um, that's what we, we need to seek. We can't be solely dependent anymore on single resource streams. And so the, uh, the income statement, if you look out there to the next 15 years, this is, this is how it plays out. And, and I just, to, just to highlight here, you see the numbers behind the graph I just showed you slightly growing on the, on the on the revenue side but a different mix but on the expense side we're still this, we're still a fixed size organization so we're not solving for growth we're solving to replace the current resources if we're successful uh, these can be adjusted upward uh, so that we can actually grow our program activity we can grow staff um, as commissioner Edlin referenced in the in the in his question about our budget this, this assumes that our staff continues to go down, uh, and, but personnel costs continue to go up because of the cost of, associated with benefits and with PERS. So we still carry that obligation, and that, and that represents a hurdle for us as we, as we try and, and, and replace TIF as a, as a subsidy for our operating. Um, the, other, the other thing to point out here, and, and it, we'll get to it in the, in the overview of the recommended policy is that we're, we're putting a budget on our cat on our grant activity and that budget declines over the course of this uh, basically due to the to the limited resource base that we have to fund those grants um, the problem we're solving for isn't just an operating revenue issue it really is around project capital so while while we don't model pro, uh, capital that comes into projects that we work on we, we are trying to think through where capital will come from uh, on projects that would normally be funded by TIF. And so we, the, the plan actually gets into some detail on, on each of these. But, but um, our projects, the way our projects are funded will look very different 10 years from now than they do now. And they'll have multiple sources of capital, probably more, more private debt, but you might see more tax credit deals. You might see more foundation money in our deals and even some new tools like, like crowdfunding as a way to replace um, the lower cost of capital that TIF represents right now. Um, as I mentioned, the, our real estate portfolio is going to represent a substantial uh, part of the, of the new revenue growth for the agency. This involves us ramping up our, our development activity. And so you can see the summary here how our portfolio remains fairly steady uh, in terms of what we dispose of and the properties that, that we retain. The activity on our real estate portfolio really is around new properties that we develop. And you can see the, 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 the resource generation that that represents over the life of the plan. And the same is true on the parking side. So the parking garage that we discussed in the hearing, previous hearing, 
uh, at the, uh, for the Convention Center Hotel represents the first of what we project to be five, five additional parking garages that would be built over the life of this plan that would unlock developments in particular parts of the city that we believe are constrained by a lack of parking, would consolidate more parking and public ownership, which means it's more shared use, it's more efficiently used, in the process, we we uh, we actually create a an asset for the PDC that that, re that acts like a long term annuity, and that revenue stream can grow over time, particularly as we retire debt, as we talked about earlier. Um, and lastly, we still need to have an impact in the work we do, and we can talk about that impact in a variety of ways. But one way is just to quantify it based on on our financial investment. And so this is this this. Uh, estimate here represents, is, is based on the same metrics that we see in our annual results. So every year we report annually on the impacts, and if you kind of work back, we can see what it means. Every dollar we invest represents a number of jobs or represents leverage or represents, you know, uh, multiplier effect. So we believe that this model can still generate significant impact in whatever way you want to look at it, whether it be small businesses or new jobs or construction investment, um, and, and we would still be engaged in activities like our enterprise zone, which, which does attract significant amount of private investment, and, that's, and that ultimately generates the, the, the majority of the impact, um, maybe state that in a, in a, in a more eloquent way. Um, the, the impact of our work is really the private dollars that we attract. If we get a five to one leverage, that means that Every dollar we, we put in, there's $4 of private investment. That's where the real impact comes, and that's the role that we need to continue to play, attracting private investment to our projects. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the plan is not to adopt this, this uh, business plan today. We want to talk about this investment policy update, uh, but we, we do want direction from you. We have some questions after Peter, after Peter talks to give us direction on how to proceed on this. But we do expect this playing out over the next year as we, we talk to the mayor-elect, as we talk to council, and as we begin to reach out to the public um, so that a year from now we would be in a position uh, with the right level of support, both from political leadership as well as the public, to, uh, to adopt, to finalize and, and adopt um, this plan. But today we, we would like you to take a, to, to, to consider adopting one piece of this, which is a set of investment principles that we've added um, as, an, as an amendment or an addendum to our um, current financial investment policy. And I'll turn it over to Peter. Peter Englander, um, Opportunities Cooperative. Uh, commissioners, we, uh, we have a financial investment policy. Uh, it is broken really by, uh, down into two sections. And as Patrick said, we're, we're looking at uh, significantly enhancing one section of it and then um, making some amendments to the other section. The two sections talk about how we invest our money and then also the process by which we review our investments. So when things come to you, they go through a financial investment committee. Uh, th this, uh, the, the previous resolution and this resolution continue to talk about those two things. But what we really are doing here is a significant change in our investment principles, and this is something that was discussed during the Financial Sustainability Committee. The first bullet point that you see here is exactly the same as what was in our financial investment policy before. It was just that. So when investing public resources to achieve its, our strategic plan, uh, we'll apply, PDC will apply sound uh, financial guidelines and accountable and transparent process. That was it. This further clarifies exactly what that means uh, in, the, in the context of the financial uh, business plan that, that we're putting forward today just to get things moving. So it, uh, the first one really talks about that balance where we will always continue to seek public benefit, but adding to that the public benefit of getting a financial return and really thinking about that much more explicitly every time we do that. And I think the most important thing to think about that is that we're always doing this for the benefit of the public. This isn't for the sustainability of our staff. It's for the sustainability of the agency to do the good that we do and to continue to be able to do that. And there is, uh, it's a matter of the, the way that you think about the risk return. It, 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 it's a matter of how you think about public subsidy uh, and thinking about it in a, in a more impact investment way. This is something that is growing in interest uh, nationwide, globally, and uh, I think this really puts us in line with what's been going on 
um, elsewhere in the, in the world. And really, we're approaching it from a different standpoint. We've always done the public benefit. Now we're looking at the financial return aspect to it, whereas you know all of us privately think about the financial return, but now we want to do more public benefit. Um, the other three points uh, really talk about how we do that a little bit more explicitly as well. Really thinking about our targets on, on leverage, going into our projects realizing that we want to minimize the amount of PDC or public investment that goes into things. And then the bottom two uh, make us a, a lot more uh, accountable in how we think about our grant process. So not only uh, how much money we spend, but going into everything that we do with this global perspective of our, of our total resources, that there's only so much of our total budget that we want to fully grant knowing that there's going to be no return of that money and being very conscientious about it. So this really expands what our financial investment principles are. This would be direction for the Financial Investment Committee to staff in how they present things to the Financial Investment Committee for recommendation to the Executive Director, and then also as how this board reviews uh, the investments that come here. So this would be quite a change uh, in the thinking within the agency. And uh, I just wanted to point out, uh, Commissioner Dixon, you, you talked a lot about culture when we talked about this topic last April. And this is where we'd really be shifting the culture of the agency as well as the city and thinking about the work that we do. Uh, the second part of it is that second part of the, of the current resolution where we talk about this, the scope of the F Financial Investment Committee review. These, uh, the revision here is, is quite, uh, uh, everything here except for one point, the middle point, PDC debt financing, uh, are, are, uh, is, is a policy that's currently in place. Uh, there is a slight bit of change to the language in the second bullet point where it says loan modifications. And we've just added the language where approval has not been delegated by the executive director. That's always been true anyway, but I think it makes it more explicit. But the fourth bullet point where it says PDC debt financings, this is where when we get into a situation where we will be borrowing money, uh, uh, how, how any of those uh, borrowings will also need to go through the Financial Investment Committee as well. But everything else here is in the current policy. So with that, uh, we have a list of questions that we thought uh, could start the discussion. But you're asking us those questions? <laughs> well, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, first of all, I like uh, what you're doing. I think it's a great. Uh, I think it's a great plan. I think I like the uh, change in strategy, culture. I'm just wondering how hard or or maybe ideally easy do you think it will be to implement that within the organization? You're talking about culture. Yeah, the cultural yeah. shift that we're just referring to. I would tell you that it's, it's, it has been concepts that we've talked about for a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the, the ideas are not new. Uh, uh, I think back to a finance rethink that we did when Patrick first started here at PDC. And I, I recall some direction we got from Commissioner Will Hoyt at the time where he said specifically, I'll never forget this. And I reminded him on his last day, let's call a grant a grant. Let's not go into it thinking it's a loan and then knowing it's a grant. Let's go into it knowing what it is. So I think what this does is make some things very, very explicit. Um, it's still a change. Mm -hmm. And um, we all need to get our heads around how this agency can operate differently. I think many of us who come to this agency from the private sector, we have to figure out how to think like PDC and I think this moves us a little bit more closer to a, a, a mindset that is not as different from the private sector as it always had been in the past. It's going to be a shift, absolutely. And I think it's going to take a fair bit of discussion with staff. One of the things that we did over the last year in trying to inculcate the, the strategic plan was have a discussion about culture around uh, financial sustainability. So we started this discussion of, among a, a small group, and that small group came up with recommendations to the leadership team about what kinds of things that, 
that, that the leadership can do differently to start bringing this kind of culture into the organization. I, I still think it's a lift. Thank you. I, you know, I, w I would just add that the, particularly with respect to the policy, um, uh, we can think of all sorts of examples of, of transactions and projects where PDC has operated exactly according to these principles. And these are like great stories about us getting our money back and, you know, but then we can also think of all these stories where we just, you know, gave it away or forgave it, right? So the issue isn't that we don't know how to do this, it's that we don't do it consistently. consistently. Yeah. And we don't have the discipline across the organization to say, no, this is how we do business. It's like, it's, you know, the, the, where we do it, that's, okay, that was that deal. And then, so everything's viewed and it's kind of, it's more compartmentalized in how we think about it. Because, you know, some deals are like, that's just meant for public benefit. And, and so we need to, you know, you know, not ask for the money back or give the money. So we need to, so that's what we're trying to accomplish with this on the culture side is it's, it's okay to try and try and operate according to these principles all the time. Like you can still get the work done. And, and to the extent that, that a lot of money goes out the door through one way, we're, that, that, then there's no integrity around the business plan you know, long term. So that's why you have, to, you have to bring it all under one umbrella set of, of, of principles. Yeah, I guess I'd add you know, the, the two great examples that we tend to bring up were ones in, in, in which we got enormous public benefit. One is Pioneer Place. And the other is the White Stag project, which was part of everything that we did down on Ankeny and Burnside. We still got enormous public benefit. The White Stag project was the first project that led off um, our transformation around Ankeny and Burnside. And so there was an enormous public benefit that came out of that. Tens of thousands of people come to Old Town Chinatown that didn't before because the University of Oregon chose to relocate in Old Town Chinatown. Enormous public benefit. We were able to get a financial return, quite honestly, because of leadership of our chair at the time, Mark Rosenbaum, who said, I want to see if this actually turns out as good as it possibly could for us to be able to look back and be able to recover some of the interest that we are currently subsidizing in order for us to make sure this project is successful. Thank you. So I would uh, have some observations. Uh, first of all, Peter, I think you did a great job of pulling the committee together. I was really pleased to see the consistent participation of uh, people besides Tom and I, and the comments and suggestions that they made, I thought they were really good. Um, so I thought that was a good process. Um, I don't think we really had anybody outside of that come to observe or anything like that, which kind of leads me to um, questioning ourselves, what kind of vetting process do we need to go through? Because I really see this as a, a sea change. Um, and it's, it's, it's a big deal. And it, I, I look at that chart that you put up there at every meeting, and um, it's going to, I mean, it's right at our doorstep now. And the thing that scares me is time. And, and I think as a board, you know, we need to get our arms around this and make some decisions and move forward. Um, real estate outside of fees or great markets or luck tends to be a, a slow growth deal. Mm -hmm. And you look at the revenues that we've projected in there down the road, and if we don't start planting those seeds today, they're not going to be there six years from now, and we're going to be in a real world hurt at that point in time. Um, I also think on, on the culture side, and I've watched this in another uh, not current not-for-profit that I work with that we're trying to shift to a, um, a mixed mission uh, versus earning our way uh, through earned income, which is what I kind of see us doing here, trying to do mm -hmm. here. Um, it's, it's a constant balancing act, and I, I see that with staff going to be a, a real challenge. Um, I don't care who the staff is or, or you know, I mean, I care who they are, but I think regardless of the makeup of the staff, that, that's a big change. And I, and I think as a board, like the, uh, the FIC, I, I would hope to see them struggling with that and discussing that and debating it and so on and so forth. And some projects, we're going to hopefully look to make more money and maybe less mission to feed the part that's doing the mission. And I think that's going to be a big challenge for us. Um, and how the outside world views that, uh, again, coming back to how do we vet it, um, you know, there's some people probably in my industry that's not going to be happy about this. Right. Um, and there's some people who are going to applaud it. Um, and so I think thinking about how we go out and vet that's equally as important. So, so we jumped in the conversation. I, 
um, just want to make, we have three people invited to testify. I don't know if we have any others signed up, but. Um, We've just got the three. And okay. It might be that best that we have them. Yeah, come up, because I know that they, they're all been, been involved in this, and I think they would add to the conversation sooner rather than later. So we'll. Let's make room for them and have them come up. We have uh, Debbie Iona and uh, Michelle Reeves and Ken Rust. Um, Ken and uh, Debbie have been on the Future Sustainability uh, Committee, and, and uh, Michelle is from the Neighborhood Economic Development Leadership Group. I'm just going to take you and list them. So, Debbie, you're first. You want me to go first? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, and thank you for your service on that. Well, thank you, too. <laughs> uh, I'm Debbie Iona and served as the League of Women Voters representative on the Financial Sustainability Committee. I welcome the opportunity to comment on the process and the draft report. The League has followed the city's use of urban renewal and PDC's activities for a number of years. We commend PDC for looking ahead to a time when tax increment financing will no longer provide a steady source of revenue to the agency and exploring other options. We also encourage City Council, PDC leadership, and the public to engage in a robust discussion about whether PDC should continue to carry out the city's redevelopment and economic development activities. This report provides the foundation for those discussions. Throughout the committee process, I stress the importance of explaining the rationale for PDC's continued existence. If PDC will no longer be managing urban renewal districts and relying on TIF for its funding, then would it be possible or desirable for a city bureau to assume the city's economic development responsibilities? Is PDC uniquely equipped to continue to perform these functions. The report explains clearly PDC's history, mission, and functions, and provides a comprehensive picture of how it contributes to the city's economic development and redevelopment efforts. This is the information city council and the public need to begin that conversation. If the decision is made that PDC should continue to carry out the city's economic development work, Council will need to identify a stable source of funds to carry it into the future. Allocating a portion of boomerang funds, those generated by the growth in property taxes due to urban renewal activities, is a logical approach. This would provide a stable base on which the other options listed in the report could be added. The League also agrees with the concept of targeted use of TIF districts, drawing only from the city's portion of property tax growth. We suggested this idea some years ago. There clearly are many uncertainties about the income earning potential and risks associated with some of the approaches described in the report, as expressed by several of the committee members during our meetings. All of these issues should be further explored. The report could be improved by adding an alternatives analysis describing other approaches that the city could take other than maintaining PDC to carry out its economic development work. The League appreciated the opportunity to, to participate as a member of the committee. The process was well run. Staff members were responsive to questions and feedback. The information provided by the consultants helped the committee understand and consider the pros and cons of various approaches to gut generating revenue and how other economic development agencies operate. The League looks forward to participating along with other members of the community in these important discussions. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you raise a very valuable question about the ongoing existence of the organization itself. Does the League have a recommendation? Nope. I, I think I, I want to just kind of echo what you were saying. I mean, this was a, you know, a small group that we met without a lot of outside uh, um, influence. And I think I would love to hear, I mean, there are people I respect out in the community who have a lot of interactions with PDC, and it would be good to hear from them. The one thing I think that is PDC's greatest strength is 
the continuity that it has. You know, it's, there's not a new elected official every four years. If it was a bureau, you know, you can just imagine, or any time the mayor wanted to reassign. Um, you know, you board members are here, you know, you, you span administrations, and so does the executive director, and I think that is, you know, a big plus on PDC's uh, positive column, because it's easier to continue doing sustained work when you don't have a lot of churning, you know, over the years. Do you foresee the league making a recommendation? Well, I think if we participated, you know, as we are hoping to do, yeah, by the end we, uh, you know, when we hear from everybody, we would like to, we would like to weigh in. Right. Thank you. And thank you for your participation. Much. Thank you. Ken? Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kelly and members of the Commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Ken Rust. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the City of Portland, and I've been a member of the PDC Financial Sustainability Committee. I'd like to echo a lot of the comments that uh, Debbie said about the work that the Committee had done and, uh, and, the, and the thoroughness of the effort. But I'm really here to testify today in support of the PDC Resolution Number 7194, uh, dealing with financial policy. The resolution before you, I think, establishes a prudent financial policy that will help guide investment decisions in support of PDC's strategic plan. As a public finance officer, I think an organization is best served when it adopts and follows financial policies that help to ensure that its near and long-term fiscal health can be maintained. Such policies help to clarify how decisions will be made, how impacts will be measured, and provides transparency and certainty to management, decision makers, and the public at large. Over the past 20 plus years, I have worked with PDC in the implementation of financing plans for its urban renewal districts and in helping to execute the public finance elements of many of the complex development agreements that have reshaped our city. Much of that success has been the result of an expansive tax increment program that, uh, how, that we all know is no longer going to be the future for us and that the, that future will look very different than it has in the past. The long-term business plan that's been presented to you and reviewed by the Financial Sustainability Committee envisions a much, a much more diverse mix of revenues that includes property and asset management fees, program income, public funds in the form of a portion of the property tax revenues received by the city when existing urban renewal districts expire and the targeted use of new TIF districts. The plan assumes that these revenues will be managed with a more careful eye towards long-term financial returns, returns that will be critical to PEC's long-term fiscal health and success. If approved, this res resolution and policy will provide PDC with a strong fiscal foundation to help guide those investment decisions as it transitions to a new business and financial model. I encourage you to adopt the, the policy before you today, and I look forward to working with PDC in the development and execution of its long-term business plan. Thank you. Ken, uh, has the city started to forecast a, a so-called boomerang um, revenue that we're going to see eventually? Uh, Chair Kelly, you know, there's been discussions with the city council. Uh, the city, as you may be aware, typically prepares five-year financial forecasts for most of its funds, including the general fund. So uh, we've had discussions with the council about current fiscal condition, and the city right now is enjoying an embarrassment of fiscal riches almost. Um, and we know that there are many other things the council would like to do. And as we're looking at some of those longer term liabilities, we've discussed what I've called these over the horizon revenues, this, this TIF revenue that will be realized uh, or the return of property tax revenues when TIF districts expire. But those are really beyond the, torp the typical planning process for the city. So one, they are aware of it and beginning to become more aware of it, but it's no longer, it's not at this point in time in any adopted financial plan. And so I think it's really, the right opportunity to start having those discussions, start framing the issue and the importance both to the city and to the, to, the, to the PDC about how to share in those resources and to do it in such a way that if planned for and built into those future for forecasts as the revenues materialize, it doesn't feel like someone's losing something, but it's really something that's already been planned for. When the city does that on, on these kinds of things, it tends to make it much less painful and much less of a surprise. So I think the opportunity is there, and the time to do it is to, is to have those discussions is now before they start getting built into those financial plans. Thank you. Over what period of time do you see that kind of gelling? Well, I think it's uh, you know critical now. We have a new mayor-elect that will be coming into office. I think having that conversation about the, the current uh, status of PDC, its long-term plan, and how the, those boomerang revenues and the ability to help 
utilize a portion of those revenues in the future success of the agency. That's really a timely discussion. I think having that kind of discussion with the mayor-elect and the council and then starting to frame that up in subsequent uh, budgets, maybe even having a budget note in, in, the, in the city's kind of fiscal parlance to start directing that the uh, city budget office begin uh, building that into future forecasts. I think that there's a process that we're pretty familiar with that having the discussions with the elected leadership at the city of Portland can start that process and over the course of the next year or so is when I think it would make sense to begin implementing it. All right. Any more Sorry. questions for Ken? Michelle Reeves, welcome. Okay, I'm gonna have to apologize, I'm over-caffeinated. So I talk too fast anyway, but it's, it's gonna be bad today. So I'm a member of the NED group. I'm also uh, a revitalization consultant, so I work around the country on economic development issues. And I'm gonna give you kind of a quick brain dump of some things that came up in the last NED meeting when Patrick presented uh, this plan to us. I also wanna make, I am not, this is not something that the entire NED group has signed off on or voted on, these are kind of initial impressions and uh, conversations that came up. Um, the first thing I wanna share is a conversation that came up after the meeting where some people were trying to figure out the closest analogy from a government perspective of an organization that sort of does what I'm calling it PDC 2.0 uh, would do. And we came up with a port, sort of structurally acting in a similar way, managing real estate to meet economic development goals as this sort of quasi-public agency with a board. Um, so I'm gonna use a port analogy to talk about some of the NED feedback. So the, the first thing I'm gonna say about a port is the existence of the port is something that everyone understands fundamentally, uh, why it's there. So they may not agree always with how the port manages what they do, but they don't really question whether or not on a fundamental level there should be a port. And uh, everyone knows kind of what it does and the role that it plays in the city. So those are things if you just walked around and did a man on the street interview, people would kind of understand about a port. I think that's important in gathering, some of you ask questions about that and, and even reference like what do people think of this? So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. I think you need a tremendous amount of clarity in that same vein around this idea of PDC 2.0. What problem is PDC solving? Why is PDC the organization to do it? And is this the best structure to fund it and move forward with it? I think those are questions that pretty much nobody can answer in the community. And if they can't, they're not gonna support this. And so I think that's something that needs to be, I think we get very inside baseball about continuity and you know economic development roles. But I think on a large scale basis, those are things that are not meaningful for your average person in Portland and they don't understand why they're important. And so, Moving forward, everything you do, you have to figure out how to frame that so it's compelling and something that everyone understands in kind of a simple way. Um, I would say that PDC has sort of moved from a development agency into more of an economic development agency over the last five or six years, and I think that has made its role harder for people to, to understand. I think you have kind of an east side, west side perception issue. I think people on the west side think, hey, PDC did a great job catalyzing a lot of central city development. I think people on the east side say, we don't know what PDC does. And I think they still feel that way. And I think that's something that's gonna have to be sort of overcome and addressed in moving forward with the, the 2.0 plan. Um, I do wanna make a side note, I work all around the country and I think actually in the last five to six years with the neighborhood economic development work that uh, PDC is doing some really innovative work around equity. And I share some of the lessons and some of the things that we work on in PDC and other communities. And I don't think that PDC has necessarily gotten the recognition for that um, on the east side. Um, but definitely have to get clarity around that uh, idea moving forward. I'm gonna go back to my port analogy now. I'm gonna talk about, and this was something that Mark brought up. Um, so the port's mission and their areas of responsibility are very much in alignment. And so they manage a host of different specialized commercial real estate assets to meet kind of regional economic development goals. And they, you know, pursue lucrative contracts and, and they make sure things make sense financially and a whole host of other things. Um, <laughs> PDC 2.0, if they're developing and managing commercial real estate as a way to fund equity work, we have this kind of essential tension uh, between those two things that I think is gonna be very difficult to navigate. And that was something that came up in the, the discussions. We had a very short Q&A period at the end of the, the NED meeting. So to make money from real estate, you are developing at for the top end of the market and you're tenanting around highest and best use. That's how you make money in, in real estate. Um, 
For equity goals within that, you're looking at workforce and contracting generally. So that is a tough spot to be in if you're trying to make money, which is not necessarily meeting equity goals in order to generate funds that allow you to make equity goals. There's just this sort of constant political dance you're going to have to play between the two. And I, I think that that could potentially be tough. Some other things that are tough is that real estate income is lumpy and it's not liquid. So one of the big questions that came up in the NED meeting is the very time we need all these resources is when the economy crashes. And when the economy crashes is the very time you generate zero dollars from your real estate holdings. So what happens then? So if the whole reason we have you know, PDC 2.0 is to meet these equity goals and, and then we can't do it when we need to, very big concern to the, the NED community. Um, I also think, so the Portland Mercado Project is a great example of playing an important role as patient capital. You're developing equity in that project, but you're not going to be generating cash flow from it for a while. And so again, there's this tension between creating equity and, and generating cash flow. Um, the fourth thing I want to say is PDC has real disadvantages as a developer, other than parking. I think parking is a, a compelling role to, to, to develop parking. Um, so as a public sector agency, it's always going to take PDC longer, and it's always going to be more expensive for PDC to develop property than the private sector. So I think there are a lot of challenges around that model. I don't think that it's not that they can't be overcome, but I, I think there's a lot of work to do around that to feel like, hey, it's going to make sense and, and be workable. The third thing that I wanted to just talk about briefly on the port structure is their organizational structure as an entity. So they have a big real estate department that does nothing but manage real estate, just probably like uh, the employees that Mark has that manage real estate. And they look at it in a very private sector sort of way. That is not the way PDC has been set up. It is not the staff specialties um, that they have now. So. You know, PDC has been a catalyzer and a partner with the private sector to get them to build property. They have not been an owner and a manager and a developer of their own assets. So it's going to be a huge phase shift from a, a staff perspective, because I would say currently that is not, you know, how PDC has been staffed up. Small things, like how is PDC politically going to handle evicting tenants? Because you're going to have to, right? That's, that's, there's so many lines to walk with in there. Um, so to summarize sort of what we discussed and the things that people were talking about after NED, how to frame this and why PDC 2.0 needs to happen, that's something everyone wanted to hear about, and resolving that essential tension. And so are you going to be, I mean, I don't know if you can do both. There's a huge role to play for patient capital around more local economic development needs. Um, or are you, you know, is there a role for you to be a developer and generate cash flow for these other kind of social equity um, kind of programs? So I, I think maybe there needs to be some clarity about a path. I think it's going to be hard to launch all of this and walk that line at the same time, but that's my personal opinion. So there's my, my speed caffeine testimony. Thank you very much. Commissioners, any more questions for any of our... It's a messy process, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I wanted to ask a little more about the NED. Um, just overall, I know you said you didn't really have a huge amount of time, but how, how? what are their feelings about the PDC and the work that we do? I think that um, most of the people that I talk to on the NED feel like there's been a complete phase shift in how PDC is willing to talk about equity and approach equity in moving forward with programs. And so they really give PDC credit as, you know, sort of a group for talking about these things and being willing to sit down and just be open and say, what do you think and what are we doing wrong and listen to that. Yeah. Um, I would say the constituencies that are represented at the table don't necessarily, I don't know that that's trickled down to a degree where people feel it's making on a collective basis a big impact in their communities still. So I would say in the communities that I worked in in East Portland, people will still complain to me about somebody that worked at PDC 12 years ago or 15 years ago that did a project out in East Portland. There's still a lot of yeah, I get yeah. that all the time as right. well as a commissioner I, uh, here. Yeah. It's it's frustrating because you, you know, when you spend as much time as I have on this board and you, you know, you're pushing a lot of really positive agendas mm -hmm. and, and you know, you speak to a lot of people that have benefited from projects and from work that we've done here, um, it's it's just really sad that that message somehow isn't conveyed well enough to the public. And I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how do, with the groups that we have and the people mm -hmm. that are representing our organization, how do we do a better job to really get that message out there? And, you know, 2.0 doesn't exist if people don't mm -hmm. think that 1.0 is valid. Right. 
Yeah. I think it's stories. Um, I think that, so, so one of the things that PDC is doing differently that I think is really profound and that I talk about in other jurisdictions a lot is when you want to create economic change in communities that aren't quite sure how to leverage their real estate assets to kind of take advantage of the positive parts of gentrification, for instance, um, it requires a different set of tools than just handing them some DOS money or some storefront money. Lots of different kinds of hand-holding, yeah. lots of different kinds of market work or retail consulting or all of those kinds of things. So it's really exciting the way that PDC is willing to take their toolkit and apply it in different ways and experiment. And so they've been really great about that and it's fun to share those lessons. There are interesting outcomes from this work and it's finding avenues to tell those personal stories in broader ways that people hear and understand and know that, that kind of PDC is behind. So there's just all the press that PDC gets is around the, the post office blocks. It's yeah. not around, you know, yeah. yeah. Right. So it's stories. Yep. Three or four meetings ago we had some people come in that were recipients of loans, if I recall correctly, and you know, hearing their stories and, you know, I mean, it's kind of like... Incredibly uh, compelling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think also... I, I find that very, very helpful personally to hear those success Right, stories. that they work. And I, I think also secondarily, sometimes it's nice to hear we get so inside of our bubble, like we don't... So I work a lot in communities that are where Portland was 25 years ago, and they're so focused on, oh my God, we have to improve economics here, that I've actually had to stand up and follow a mayor and say, like, no, you should be worrying about the impacts of gentrification right now. If you don't plan for it now, by the time you realize it, like, it's going to be, it's going to be over, and here are the things that we learned from Portland, and here's the, so I also think that people like to hear that we learned, we're afraid sometimes to talk about what we did wrong, right. but part of learning that having some humility and saying like we learned from that and now we're doing stuff that's sort of cutting edge portland is a city that wants to be cutting edge and so those are stories we don't um necessarily hear about enough yep, i think i agree yeah. well mm -hmm. thank you for mm -hmm. sharing um i i just i think that's just going to be the most important message that we continue to push forward as we're implementing pdc i like 2.0 <laughs> that's pretty cool um because we have to, we do have to reflect a lot of, you know, the plan, it's just fantastic. I mean, Peter and all the people that have worked behind it, it, it has a lot of meat, a lot of really important issues involved in it, but how do we message it in a way that people are receptive to it and that it does benefit and that the equity um, missions continue to be um, pushed ahead? Because sometimes when you're just focused, like you said, on the financial aspect, it, it, you can lose sight of you know who is it that we're trying to benefit and right. you know where is there's like the financial return and then the the public benefit and we ha we have to find a way that we can tie those two together in a in a more effective way I think for us to continue to be like this fantastic agency that you know we definitely have been in the last six years I'm going to just say that <laughs> and um, and and moving forward so thank you for for all your time on that um, that board as well. Mm -hmm. History will call it the Aneska time. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, let's get uh, Patrick and Peter back up here. Um, I think what we want to do is we want to first try to summarize our answers to these questions, and then um, we can talk about whether we're going to pass that uh, resolution. You know, first of all, as far as I'm concerned, is the plan responsive to the direction uh, given to staff? I, you know, I've been too in the middle of it to say I don't think so, so I'd ask the rest of you, especially those of you who weren't on that sustainability committee. Um, seems, it seems responsive to me. Yeah, so I'm, yeah. It's starting in the right direction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The next question is, does the plan enable PDC to accomplish the objectives of the strategic plan? Um, which again, I've been in the middle of it, but it sure seems to me like that's, there's a deep connection there. So, yeah. I, the only comment I have is time. Yeah, and I would just say, as Michelle highlighted, there, it is, you know, the, the plan has to account for this tension between the, right. you know, from the real estate business or whatever market demands uh, what the agency has how do you stay true to the to the equity goals, the, the, you know, the, to the public benefit side of it? And I think that's going to be the implementation challenge. I think conceptually we tried to put it out there that way, but it's it's a really an implementation challenge, you know, year over year. 
you know, and I think we talked about this at the last uh, financial sustainability meeting is that we still, I mean, my feeling is we've yet to really sort of define the front end of all this. What is the, the clear rationale for the next 20 years of PDC and its role in the community? I mean, we have a good plan to do that. We haven't gotten yet to the definition, and yeah. I think that, yeah. okay. for me, um, I, I think we've got a lot of the pieces, but we haven't really just formalized it as well as we could. Um, I think, as usual, the plan is really good. I, I think similar to what Commissioner uh, or Chair Kelly has stated is it's the implementation, it's the follow through, it's the, you know, really tracking that everything that we have kind of listed in our strategic plan, especially in terms of kind of our equity and um, prosperity gap um, issues are addressed because I just think too often you know, they're part of the plan, but they just get overlooked. And I just want us to continue to really focus on that. And I think what we're hearing is, I think we heard it from Debbie that we're not done. Um, you know, I want to get this, this plan to the point where the League of Women Voters would endorse it. I mean, I think those kinds of things are really important, as, as well as a lot of other constituents. Um, and I think maybe that's a place for us to have more discussions with people like Debbie about how do you see us, what's our next steps to get to the finish line on that? How should PDC start the conversation with elected leaders? Uh, you know, I guess that leads to, from my thinking, that leads to us passing the, the uh, financial policy now, um, which I'm for doing because I think we don't want to wait a long time on that. And it's always, if there's something there that doesn't work and we discover it later, we can always unravel it. But I think we want to put it in place now and put it in clearly in place. Um, so they're not, we're not saying, well, a year from now, we've got this plan completely figured out, but sure wish we would have set these things in motion way back then. Yeah. Um, so what do you all think of that? Well, I think, I. Two things with respect to conversation. I think a couple of the last, uh, you know, out of the testimony we received here last, Mr. Rust made the recommendation that we start discussing the boomerang revenues. I think that's critical. And then Michelle, I apologize, I didn't catch her last name, but I thought she made a very good point about outreach and the um, east west divide, if you will, in terms of the perception of the PDC and delivering the message and the stories that flesh out the good work that's being done. And that, you know, goes to what, a, you know, Aneshka's comment, which is, it's a fantastic plan. You know, we need to let people know about the plan and let people know better what we're trying to do. We need to do a better job of letting people know the things we're doing at PDC, mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Have you, has staff had internal discussions about um, starting to meet with elected officials and other stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, the, the question, I mean, we weren't trying to be literal about the questions. We, you know, so yesterday I had my last briefings with Commissioner, Commissioners Fish and Fritz, and I shared with them the plan. I, I went through the presentation at a high level, um, you know, it started talking about boomerang funds, and, and then uh, we've reached out to, to Mayor Leck Wheeler to, to find time to sit with him on, and talk about this, and, and, and you know, Faye and Kimberly will continue the conversations with council. So we're moving ahead. I mean, it's so, so, so it's more, all right, we've talked about it, where's everybody sit, and then what does that then lead to in terms of the, the process? Uh, what, what does the public conversation look like? Um, and, and, you know, what is the appetite for, uh, for the political leadership to take, take this on? I mean, it, you know, the, I mean, the, the, the idea that PDC needs to push out its stories more is not a new new concept. It's almost that Peter's been here 15 years. I've only been here eight and a half. So 15 years ago was probably the case that people were saying PDC needs to, and people need to hear what the work is. Um, so, so part of the challenge in this is even if you do a great job, you're still in this environment in which you're going to have skepticism about why should we support PDC, or why should we devote more public dollars to PDC, or right? So, so that ultimately becomes a political 
kind of conversation in addition to the community conversation. So that's a big part of it, and that's and that's in some respects going to be some of the early conversation is is what is the level of support you know from the mayor elect and council to really to really have this conversation in the community. Um, it hasn't always been a popular topic. And I guess the reality is, is that like we have pointed out for a, quite a while now is this is going to happen whether we want it to or not. The resources are declining. So yeah. there's nothing we can actually do or say that's going to change that. And the, the real question now and as the board and as leaders is, you know, what are we today going to do about it? So I'm going to stop the discussion for just a moment and recognize the presence of our newest commissioner, Alicia Moreland. Um, just welcome. So, um, I, are we are we ready for a motion on the resolution? Sure, I'll I'll move that we approve it, and I would also add that we start moving quickly with elected officials and stakeholders and exploring those conversations and come up with a strategy of how we're going to do that. I'll definitely second it. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. The motion carries. Again, Peter, thank you for pulling that committee yeah. together and making it work as well as it did. Good work. Recognize Peter again on his yeah. way out the door. Thank you very much. Thanks really appreciate you. it. Um, what I would say to you is that um, over time, I think we've had to care a lot more about the level of our work. When I first started at this agency, I think we cared less about what the public thought. And I think, and I remember very specifically the League of Women Voters when we had to approve an extension of the downtown waterfront urban renewal area, which has been around since 1974. And when it expires, it will have been around 50 years. And I think that's when we started realizing, and then of course when we extended the River District um, and expanded it, into Old Town Chinatown, again, at the recommendation of the League, at the League of Women Voters, that we started to have to realize how important those stories were. And, and then thirdly, when we moved into this, uh, the Neighborhood Economic Development Strategy, um, and, and I think Michelle's point about East Side, West Side is, is, is true. And, uh, and having that humility and how we have learned, I think that's been part of the longevity of this organization is that that we have learned. I think it's been more reluctant in the past, but I think we've been much more open and honest, and I think that needs to continue. So thank you very much for the privilege of uh, serving you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Captain, you. One, one follow-up, uh, looking over to our right-hand side of the room, I heard you say Faye and Kimberly will pick up the ball from here. Yes. In terms of that communication, great. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody okay? Or you want to have a break or keep going? All right. Keep going. Yep. Let's just keep going. Our next one is item 16, adopting prosperity investment program guidelines. Kimberly Branham and Bernie Karofsky. Did I say that right? All right. Good afternoon, Chair Kelly, Commissioners, Executive Dir Director Quinton. So I'm Kimberly Branham, I'm Deputy Director here at PDC, and I am joined by Bernie Karofsky, who is our Senior Business Development Coordinator with the Community Economic Development Team. And we are here to seek your approval to adopt program guidelines for a new grant product, the Prosperity Investment Program, or PIP, within our urban renewal areas. If approved, the Prosperity Investment Program would replace the three current available grants, the Storefront Improvement Grant, Development Opportunity Services, and Green Features Grant Program within each of our urban renewal areas. While each grant individually is of modest scale, together they represent the largest single business line that we have in terms of the number of products that we have for fin uh, within our financial products. So while these are modest grants and modest uh, levels of investment, this really does have a significant impact in the community and into the staff, the many staff who touch these grants. So I'm going to briefly discuss the goals of the new program and the process we undertook to develop it, and then Bernie will talk about 
our investment priorities, key features of the grant, and next steps on implementation. So there are three primary reasons that we seek to replace our existing tax increment financed backed grants with a new one. The first is the need to align our grant products with the new strategic plan, which emphasizes wealth creation within communities of color and low-income communities, access to middle-income jobs, and healthy, complete neighborhoods. Our existing tools worked well for facade improvements place, and a placemaking perspective, but do not necessarily allow for the comprehensive kind of internal tenant improvements or range of technical assistance that could be most useful to a business looking to grow its sales or reduce its cost. The second is given our precious tax increment resources, as you just heard, the pre, uh, and the premium that the agency needs to place on any dollar that's granted, we also needed to make sure that our grant program support projects that would otherwise not happen and went to the most deserving and were widely spread amongst community members. And finally, we wanted to respond to client feedback on what would make the process easier from their perspective and to reduce any administrative hurdles from a staff perspective, given the volume and the fact that in an era of declining staff resources, we wanted to make the program as efficient and effective as possible. So the process that we went through um, began in earnest about four months ago, so it was a fairly quick product, but had been percolating for a couple of years. There had been innovations um, like the adoption of the Green Features grant program, um, which Stephen Green started, he's, he's here, and was the first program that we used that began to do internal investments. We also have the Halsey-Widler investment. Um, there's a pilot program, which also has started to think about how you can leverage internal, not just <coughs> external investments. Um, but we took a more comprehensive look at the $9.7 million that we've collectively invested in the last five years in 800 individual projects to, to determine what were some of the trends that we saw and how could we make it a better, um, make better products. So we learned that the average grant is about $12,000. So again, these are modest uh, sizes and that most um, businesses or property owners accessed one to two grants. So you're looking at about twelve to $25,000, but some did need as much as fifty to $60,000. We also looked at the um, we, we have implemented in the last five years a strategic alignment and equity lens, and we looked at the results of that. We found that in the interstate urban renewal area, for example, we have increased investments uh, in businesses and properties owned by people of color from 40 to 68% over the last five years. Uh, that includes nonprofits that are culturally specific. Um, while in Lenstown Center, the increase has been more modest, so from about 35 to 40%. In the central city urban renewal areas where there's been a focus on long-term property owners and um, cluster industries, we've seen that about 40% of the investments were made in, in those um, areas. So we use this information um, and then staff's own expertise and some of the client feedback to establish the recommended guideline, guidelines that Bernie's going to talk about. <coughs> And so um, before I pass it over to Bernie, I do want to rec recognize the staff that has worked on this. So Bernie chaired the group, um, and Laura Alcenis, Sue Ball, and Crispino Taylor, Dana Decline, Sarah Harpole, Kevin Johnson, Pam Johnson, no relationship, um, Bernie Karowski, Susan Kuhn, Sue Lewis, Robert Smith, Nix Nixie Stark, Will Fear, and Allison Wicks all worked really hard. They sat there every week for two hours, had homework in the middle to put together what I think is going to be and we hope will be a really effective product. Um, and as Michelle um, mentioned I, um, at the same meeting that we heard about the long-term business plan, we also talked about this product and got great feedback from the Neighborhood Economic Development Leadership Group um, as some of our initial outreach. So Bernie will talk about how we plan to incorporate that. Thank you, Kimberly. Good afternoon, Chair Carley, Commissioners, Executive Director Quinton. So let me just start first by just giving a little bit of background on our current grant programs before I talk about the details of this new grant program that we're proposing. Um, some of these grant programs literally have been around for decades. For instance, the storefront program was launched in 1989, and they've been very successful, but our focus as an agency is changing, so we see a need to change these grant programs to better align with the strategic plan. So. Again, the storefront improvement program has been around since 89. Of course, as the name implies, it's for storefronts, uh, facades, signage and lighting, and it can go up to a maximum of $32,000. Usually it's a one-to-one, -one, but sometimes in some cases we can go to a three-to-one. 
Uh, the DOS, or the Development Opportunity Services Grant, uh, has been around since 1996. And that's for small-scale feasibility, property feasibility, usually for owners that don't have a lot of sophistication that are trying to figure out what, what's the highest and best use you know, for their property. And that can go up to $12,000, so it's relatively modest. The uh, Green Features Grant has been with us since 2007 and, is, is, as the name implies, is there to try to uh, enhance the you know, sustainability of, of, the, of, physical, of, the, of the business with physical uh, green features. So th those three grants, as Kimberly mentioned, would, would, would go away if, if you chose to um, adopt this resolution. And, and key components of those would become part of the, of the, new, of the new grant program that we're proposing. Last, the uh, Community Livability Grant, which started in 2006, would, would not go away. That would be focused, as it is now, on nonprofits. And so we just also want to mention that this new, the, the new grant that we're proposing would not be available for nonprofits. It would only be for for-profit businesses. That, uh, the nonprofits would be directed to the Community Livability Grant. That grant can go up to 300000 That's not typical um, of the CLG. Usually it's between uh, about ten to fifty thousand dollars, but there has been, there have been some larger grants, and so again, when these grants were created, uh, the first three specifically, it was really about place making, okay? and, we're, and, and we're transitioning more about equitable wealth creation, and and other priorities. So we see, see a need to really try to, to to upgrade our grant programs. Okay, ready? this one. Right. Yeah. Okay. So next is, uh, what is the focus, you know, in the priorities? Again, so we can get a, an alignment with our strategic plan. So what we see is, in all urban renewal areas, we would have a priority for, for businesses and property owner of color. That would be a number one priority. Also, we would look at businesses that are going to pay, quote, unquote, a living wage, or that would also agree to diversify their, their, work, their workforce. <clears throat> We're also trying to help long-term property owners and also uh, property owners that are going to pr provide um, long-term affordability. Uh, that's, we're, we're trying to do that out in lens with the new developments to try to find a way as that community and, and, the, and the property values go up. How do we provide some space for, for, for people out there and they don't get priced out of the market? And then also uh, preserving industrial land is important too. Another focus is, is areas that have community action plans, for instance, in Lentz, in Gateway, uh, in, in uh, Old Town Chinatown, and, and soon in, in North Northeast. Those, were, those, those would be priorities. So these are our key investment priorities for the, for the new grant. Okay. And then what are the, the key features of the grant? Um, so the first one is we want to support a wide range of, of both technical assistance and, and physical improvements. So without going into every single one, let, what we're adding to this is, let's say, for instance, um, a property, uh, excuse me, um, project management services. So some of our, our, our clients don't either have, have the ability or most likely it's the time because they're managing their business to manage a, 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 a real estate project. So we would provide a, a small amount of money to help them with that. Another big one is adding internal uh, improvements, like tenant improvements. So sometimes we'll, we'll, I'll be working with a client and they'll say, great, you know, I'd love to have a sign, but you know, really to get my place open, I, ne I need an ADA bathroom. And you can't give that to me under any of the programs that we have right now. So we're trying to do that. Also, it's very important that we, that we provide meaningful contracting opportunities for, for businesses owned by uh, minorities and, and women. That's gonna be a very high priority. That's uh, going to align with a long-term business plan. So this, this grant it will, will go up to fifty thousand uh, dollars, and we don't anticipate that's going to be the average grant. It'd probably be closer to around between fifteen and twenty, like what we're seeing right now. Uh, under rare circumstances, with the executive director's approval, we'd like to be able to go up to seventy-five thousand. That would be a, a case where, say, it's a, a large development that's on a whole block. Right now, a lot of grants are based on one tax lot. So if we have a project that's really large on multiple tax slots, maybe that would be an exception. Again, for sustainability, we want to do a one-to-one -one match, but there could be some cases where we would want to do three-to-one or a 75% match if there's a hardship for the, for, the, on, for the specific client. And then also, we want to be a one-and-done. You know, once this grant is given, that, that's it. Uh, right now, a lot of our grants are, are, can be renewed or people can come back every five years. 
and a lot of a lot of people do. So we're saying this is it. You know, once you get your your, your maximum fifty thousand dollars, that's it. Okay. And then also very important is 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 we're trying to streamline the process. Not especially for the clients. Right now, we'll, we'll be working with somebody and they'll start off with a DOS, that's one application, and oh, okay, well look, it looks like you need a storefront, oh, okay, now that's another application. And so and it, it's cumbersome for them and it's also cumbersome for the internal staff as we're trying to streamline and, 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 and be more efficient. So, and then there's be one application, one set of guidelines. Okay, thanks, Kimberly. Okay, so the implement, implementation and next steps. So we're thinking in July, um, again, if this is, if you so choose to approve this, that we would do a quote soft launch. Maybe we would do some grants, but, but we really would want to do the, the, the bulk of those and really hit the ground running in September because we still have a lot of work to do behind the scenes. We've started, but there's still a lot to do. We're re-engineering our internal processes and, and data systems. And um, we have to give the NED Leadership Council, who we met with um, a couple weeks ago, gave us some really good um, ideas on implementation, where some of this is coming out of how to target our outreach, uh, translating our language, and uh, excuse me, translating our application into several languages, try to bring it up to the 21st century, put it online instead of filling out a piece of paper and sticking it in the mail or faxing it. So, so we're, we're, we're getting some, uh, so we got some really good implementation strategies for them. So again, the, the target is to, is to, is to go uh, hit the ground running hard in September and then come back in September of 2017 and, 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 and see how this is working out. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Chair Kelly for questions or any other. <clears throat> The current number of um, client or people that go after the, these various grants, and you, you know how you said it's going to be a one and done. Um, how often do people come back every five years? And you know, with those kinds, of, like, what's the average amount of funds that go out to those kind of clients, and why do they do that? Well, I, I can't give you an exact statistic on what percentage come back, but, but we do have, a, you know, there's some that do come back uh, frequently um, because maybe uh, they, they want to redo the property, re refresh the storefront, uh, or they, they, they got a DOS, now they want to do a storefront. So it's, it's, it's usually cases like that. So it's not really um, where this program's going to really help enhance the internal system, like, the entire system with for the um, businesses. These are just kind of these external surface repairs that don't necessarily help with the capacity building that we're we're talking about within the strategic <coughs> plan. I just yes. want to see the benefit, yeah. the real benefit, the meat yeah. behind it. Yeah. Well, I think today you have people who who come in um, and maybe use a DOS program and then come back and do a storefront improvement. And I still think that that's within the scope of this. You have a maximum investment on soft costs of about 25,000. So you could still do pre-development technical work that would, and then you could use the additional $25,000 um, to make some of those physical improvements real, right? Okay. So, so it's not the intention to preclude that kind of thing. I think that the reality is given the limited grant resources, it doesn't seem fair um, how, given how many businesses there are for folks to come in multiple times um, when you have some people who have yet to get anything. So in exceptional circumstances, the executive director could always say, you know, this, no, this is something with staff recommendation that we should invest in again. You have a new business in this property or really what they want to do will significantly meet one of our strategic objectives. But part of what we want to do here is just communicate clearly that this isn't something to come back regularly to try to, to um, access given the few grant resources that we have. Okay. I think this is, I mean, this really makes sense with the fact that the grant resources are yeah. dwindling quite a bit and yet still targeting the mission where we have priorities as to who gets the funds. Right. And I'm assuming that the year after it launches, you'll be able to yes. address who and how and. Absolutely. One question: um, If we approve the uh, the resolution, are there any existing grant applications that are going to be affected by the change? It's a great question. We um, have decided that we would do the changeover on 
July 1st. And so anything that is um, taken in between now and July 1st, and we kind of have a soft stop. So we are, you know, there are, there are things that are in the application process. They um, are under the existing rules. July 1, we would switch to the new rules. Um, but we don't intend to have any clients, you know, kind of get kicked out just because they didn't make everything happen before July 1st. Well, it's, I've been trying to think of what, why not, and I haven't thought of anything. So I think we need a resolution. A motion for the resolution. I'd make a motion that we adopt resolution 7195. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you for your good work. Thank you, Thank you very much for your time. Okay, next one is uh, number 17, proving actions associated with the formation of a limited liability company for construction and management of 9101 Southeast Foster Road project in Lentstown Center Urban Renewal Area. Gina and they crossed you out once you weren't going to be here well, so you're here. Yep. He was over at Centennial Mills giving another tour, so. Ah, I see. Good afternoon, Chair Kelly, Commissioners, and Executive Director Quentin, and yes, Patrick, I'll miss you. This being our last commission meeting together. It's been a great run. Thank you for so much. My name is Gina V. Allen, and I am the Director of Real Estate and Lending here at PDC, and with me is Will Thayer, one of our dynamic real estate project managers. I'm delighted to be here. As you know, I have a very special place in my heart for the Lentz community. That's where my family was raised. My great-grandmother, my grandparents, my mom and dad lived there. I spent a lot of time there as a small child. It's pretty exciting to see all of that's moving forward. Last June, we brought forth three of the four projects of the first phase of PDC's larger investment strategy, as described in the Lentz five-year action plan. Today, we are bringing the 9101 Foster Project, which was originally awarded to Williams and Dame last June. The original plan called for them design, develop, construct, and own the project for 10 years, at which time PDC had the option to purchase the asset. It was structured this way to ensure that proje project delivered on both public priorities and that provided PDC an opportunity to obtain a long-term income-producing assets in further of its you know, own financial sustainability goals. Williams and Dane has delivered on its commitments to take the project through pre-development. However, due to changes in the proje project's financials and the current market conditions, they decided not to move forward with the construction of this project. PDC and Williams and Dame have agreed in principle for PDC accepting the permits, development work product, and assignable contracts in lieu of the pre-development loan payment. As you will note on this slide, there is no changes to the programming, and approximately one million of the pre-development loan has been dispersed today. The next milestones include permits by the end of June, an agreement on the work product and contracts, bid out of the GMP contract, and close the loan with PHDB. The next would be breaking ground on construction, and this is where we all cheer. As you can see here, the original schedule of Williams and Dames is on the top and reflects that they're anticipating construction start will be about a month behind, and that was due to the time frame where um, we have not yet been able to let the GMP contract and that has to be done before we can move forward. Um, so we will be coming, uh, there will be another action shortly after this to discuss that, and then of course we'll be coming back to the board for uh, both approving that contract in place after the bid, as well as the financial concepts of this particular project. Okay. Um, I would like to highlight the team for this project and note that all of the partners, consultants, and contractors that are on the team with Williams and Dame will move forward with PDC to complete this project. It is fortunate that PDC has the professional staff capacity to take the project on at this point and believe that with our agency playing this role, we will be able to ensure the project continues to move forward on the current timeline. If you look to the far right, you'll see the consultants and contractors. They're all the same ones that we're currently with Williams and Dame. It's their work that will be transferred to PDC. If you look in the middle of the capital team, there are people from both PHB providing a loan as well as their project manager, and then the lending team, two people from the lending team here at PDC. 
Most of you may not know some exciting things, and that's about our capacity and the components of our real estate and construction services team. There's over 100 years of development expertise in the development team, and no, that's not all me. <laughs> uh, in our asset management, we have uh, Stephen Blank, who's been here for 13 years. He has managed uh, affordable properties for PHB since the split. Amber also is on that team, and she's been with PDC for almost eight years. You've got the construction team. Elise heads that up, and she's daily... Uh, pulling permits, working through design work. Uh, she worked on Dawson Park. She's done the Nelson Building, Bakery Blocks, among just a few of the many projects, along with Wendy Wilcox. And then, of course, we have Colin, who is our environmental expert. So um, what I've always said about this team is that while you don't hear a lot about them, it means they're doing their job really, really well, because the only time we hear about them is when something goes wrong. So I want to uh, kind of introduce you to them and let you know that we have a dynamic team on board, and we're excited about moving this forward. So this board action, if approved, will authorize the formation of a limited liability company and transfer of the property and contracts for the purpose of constructing and operating the 9109 Foster Project in the Lentz URA. The LLC vehicle is being used for two primary reasons. The formation of pro or the form of property ownership is consistent with the way in which industry holds improved real estate property and aids in isolating potential liabilities to the value of that particular asset. Secondly, an anticipated refinancing event will seek the funds that are guaranteed by the Federal Housing and Urban Development Agency, which necessitate that the recipient be an LLC. The LLC will have PDC as its sole owner and manager. Specifically, this resolution will authorize the following actions. Formation of the LLC for the purpose of completing and operating the project. Conveyance of the PDC-owned property to the LLC. Delegation of the management of the LLC to the PDC executive director within defined constraints. Assignment of contract and work product in lieu of repayment of the pre-development loan to Williams and Damon Associates. And transfer of the residual of the pre-development loan to the LLC. If approved, these actions will allow the project team to complete the project as currently envisioned and designed by Williams and Dame. Next slide. Questions? Um, I feel like I had a question about the um, construction work. Yes. Uh, do we have someone from our end that's going to still be uh, monitoring the construction work on the project, or is it just they've been hired and you guys are happy with the work that they're going to So on? do you mean the contractor? Sorry, the contractor, yes. Oh, the contractor, so there will be another action regarding that. Um, it will, we're looking to move forward with the same contractor. Of course, all of our programs and requirements are in place. We have the equity team. Uh, on board and moving forward. So that will be the same requirements. It, it'll actually give us a better chance to really be able to know whether or not the subs that we're getting are what we believe them to be, because we'll be involved in that work daily. Yeah, that was what I was excited yeah. about. Yeah. So I'm really expecting you guys to, you know, stick it to everyone on the committee, including yourselves, that are responsible for ensuring that these policies are push forward accurately. And while you're leaving us, we I want to let you know that the equity coordinated position will be moving into the real estate department. Uh, and so we're, we're going to be right there uh, within the community and on board. And that's one of our uh, big strategies in our work plan for next year. So we're very excited about that. And we'll always think of it as the Aneshka push. All right. Thanks. Thank I you like for that. that. Are we paying ourselves a development fee on this? Um, that's a great question. Thank you, Mark. We have that available to us, and there's a variety of opportunities that the leadership team will be addressing and bring back to you those opportunities and how that may play out moving forward. And, of course, we own the land, so we don't have to put up the financing for that. So, actually, there's a, a positive over a million dollar positive uh, just in the get-go from this, not looking at the long-term asset. Great. Thank you. And the community is really happy with the fact that we have stepped in and that we're continuing with this project. They're very excited. And I think the thing that's really important for us to remember is that's a really key corner component. Uh, and, you know, we do have retail ground, ground floor space, and it's going to be really important that we engage that entire intersection. And so um, we'll be in a position to be able to make sure that happens. What's our precedence for this? 
our we, presidents. Uh, we have never, to my knowledge, and I've only been here four and a half years, actually said we were going to develop a project from ground up. But we consistently do work on projects that that entertain, you know, development through it. We've got a lot of expertise in DDAs and working from that standpoint. Um, I don't believe that PDC has entertained long-term ownership of a project. My short tenure, this is about as close as anything we've done that I think speaks to the sustainability, long-term financial sustainability right. of the organization and the direction right. we're headed. So we talked about this in the call where you were updating me, but I think something for all of us as board members to really watch because it's kind of leading the path for what the future might be for income. Yeah. And it's certainly a compelling argument to keep this project moving. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What are we going to have about a month or two delay and then we keep on going? Yeah, maybe we're, you know, we're looking maybe 45 day delay from what it was. Um, but once they quit working on the financing, they would have been delayed anyway. So uh, the great thing about us being able to pick this up is that we don't have to go back out with an RFP process, which you know ultimately could lose six to 12 months going with um, a third party developer. So the chair would accept a motion. So moved. We have a motion. I'll second. And a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you very much. I think we're just there. Our next uh, item, we were going to adjourn the PDC board meeting and convene the local contract review board. We've done that. <laughs> uh, our action item now is adopting the findings in support of and exempting the 9101 Foster Project in Lenstown Center of a Renewal Area from low bid solicitation. And uh, you two are going to talk to us about that. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, as you just mentioned, this is a, a linked um, action item with the action uh, that you just approved. And so this is a um, uh, public contracting uh, exemption process uh, that would allow uh, PDC staff to move forward and uh, and direct contract with the existing contractor that has been working on uh, the 9101 project for the last year. So uh, in order to do that, according to state statute, uh, there are two things that, that need to be shown. And so uh, the first is um, no favoritism or diminished competition. And then the second is uh, cost savings. So for the first one, uh, in terms of uh, no diminished competition, uh, we uh, went back and spoke with Williams and Dame about their selection process. Their process was um, quite similar to one that we would uh, take ourselves. So uh, they put out an RFP. They received four proposals. Uh, they then reviewed those proposals, uh, selected uh, the two that they thought were the, uh, you know, the, the, the best, and then um, brought those folks in for interviews and uh, further uh, refinement of their proposals and then ultimately selected Bremit construction um, based on, on the thoroughness of their responses. Uh, additionally, uh, as Gina had mentioned, uh, part of the original agreements with Williams and Dame were that all of the PDC policies, both the equity and green building policies, were going to, to apply. And so Bremic has been working towards that um, aim uh, all along. And so uh, those, those will all stay in place uh, without any changes. And then in terms of substantial cost savings, um, because Bremick was put under a CMGC contract with Williams and Dame, which is a two-part contract where they uh, originally provide pre-construction services and then move into a, a second part of the contract uh, where they provide a guaranteed maximum price for the construction, which if you'll recall is exactly the same contract that we signed with Northwest Demolition for the, for the demolition of Centennial Mills. Um, <clears throat> they have been providing feedback to Hacker Architecture, who's the who is the architect on the project throughout uh, the schematic design, design development, and construction drawings. And so uh, to take the, the designs out for open bid at this point uh, could potentially um, increase costs because uh, third party contractors that would be coming into bid would be coming in cold. Um, some of the design, design choices that have been made along the way are have been made specifically to um, uh, to align with uh, some of Bremick's, uh, you know, subs or, or uh, specifications that, you know, that, that they are uh, used to working with. So, uh, so I think there's, there's a very strong argument uh, to make that, that moving forward with Bremick construction uh, would be the most cost effective way to do this. Is this a structural? 
Um, I do not know. I can get back to you on that. Good team. Yeah, I mean, not to be promoting my competition, but um, <laughs> I do feel you got that, that on the record now. <laughs> No, I do. No, I feel that you know another thing is that contractors, general contractors, spend a lot of time up front. I mean, they've been probably working on behalf of this project for, you know, when you last came um, for free and doing bids and giving lots of information to the developers early on, and it, it does really seem appropriate to continue to keep them on throughout the project. And that's one thing that people kind of take for granted a lot with general contractors. That all takes time and money and effort on their behalf. So I'm, I am glad that, that they'll be able to continue on. And the, I should say that uh, the fee, uh, the, the um, contracting fee, was established with Williams and Dame under the CMGC contract. And so we would be inheriting that contract. And so that fee would remain. And it's a very reasonable fee at 4.3%. Four, uh, 4 oh, well, hey, they are doing better than a lot of us then. And it seems like, again, it's going to keep the project on schedule or closer to schedule. So, Chair will accept a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Aye, aye. aye. aye Sabbath. The motion carries. Thank you. Thanks. So, we're going to a, adjourn the local contract review board and reconvene the PDC board meeting for some very important business. So, oh, we yes, we have some very important testimony coming. Um, so item 19, uh, the resolution of commendation and appreciation of Ineska Dixon for distinguished service and outstanding dedication to the Portland Development Commission and the city of Portland. Um, my directions say make my own remarks first. So um, I've known Ineska and her family for a number of years and have a tremendous amount of admiration both for her and for her family. Um, you know, I think when you serve on a, a commission like this, it, the commission ends up with its own personality and, and Ineska, um certainly has done a wonderful job of looking out for the interests of, um, you know, particularly minorities, I think, but also the interests of our community in general and, and uh, has uh, always ha asked very sharp questions and um, has demonstrated a great amount of care to make sure that we as a commission are, are doing our job. Um, and I've just, you know, Personally, really enjoyed working with her, and we'll miss her. Thank you. Um, so, remarks from other commissioners are next on the list, and I'll just start with you, Tato. Well, I would just say, likewise, uh, you know, I didn't know Aneshka until I joined the board, uh, but I have just been incredibly impressed with her intelligence and passion for this work, and. Uh, how devoted she is to the board and to our city and the residents. It's really impressive, and I've just really enjoyed working with you. Thank you so much. I want to hide under this table now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love your youth, uh, and um, I also applaud your um, direction and, and emphasis on equity. Um, there's too many of us old white guys and uh, having the youth and uh, the minority representation, the female representation has been tremendous. And I've always, as we've gone through topics, I've always looked forward to your comments. Um, I get a kick out of them most of the time. Uh, almost all the time, there's something I wouldn't have thought of, uh, which I enjoy even more. I don't know how you do it. How many kids do you have? I have three boys. I have to say boys. How so, old are they? Uh, 13, 12, and 6. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> I don't, really. You manage a business, you're, you've got young family, and you're giving back to the community, which is just tremendous. Um, you and I both take a little heat sometimes because of where we are in the private sector. Yeah. Um, I didn't know you before. Um, I joined the commission also, and I'm very proud of the collaboration our two firms are having now and delivering some affordable housing to the community. And uh, your firm's been a great help to us in making that happen. I'm very grateful for everything you've done, and I will miss you. Thank you so much. 
I was supposed to call everyone's attention to the slideshow that's up on the uh, screen that is actually, I think, connected with the history of Patrick and Ineska and this organization. Commissioner Myers. Ashka, it's been a true uh, honor and privilege to uh, share this side of the table with you. And uh, I look forward to uh, future collaborations with you outside of this. Um, but uh, it's, I've really uh, gained a lot from, from uh, your example on the, on the board. And I, I look forward to carrying a lot of your questions forward. So, so thank you. Really appreciate that. So you've got big shoes to fill. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a couple of individuals who are here, and, and let's, uh, let's start with previous chair of the commission and highly respected citizen of our city, Scott Andrews. And then Tony Jones, if you would like to come up to and go after Scott. Chair Kelly, Executive Director Quinton, Commissioners. I'm Scott Andrews. I am currently president of Melvin Mark Brokerage Company. And Aneshka, I can't believe it was six years ago that we started you on this adventure. Um, and my comments are going to be short, but quite frankly, I, I just want to really thank you for your service to the city and PDC, uh, for your passion to make neighborhoods better and bring more opportunity to the women and the minority communities of Portland, for taking the critical time and attention from your family and business to serve in this important capacity, for bringing critical thinking to many of the decisions the board has made over the last six years. Your background, experience, and perspective have brought a lot to the table over that time period. And finally, just for hanging in there, Frankly, no one that has never served on this board understands the weight of the responsibility, the stress, and quite frankly, how thankless this job can be. So well done, and enjoy the next chapter of your life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Tony. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Ineshka. Um, first, Ineshka, we want to, once again, like Scott said, thank you for your distinguished service to PDC. Um, and Ashka brought a much needed perspective as a businesswoman, as a construction industry professional, and as a female and African-American uh, entrepreneur. Um, a lot of times when you mention female and minority, um, folks always think, well, we gotta do more uh, and we gotta add because they don't add. But and Ashka brings it. She, she adds to the equation when she's at the table, just as the comments of everyone has said. She's worked diligently as a PDC commissioner, and she helped to shape the values of the organization for years to come. She balances how to make investments in real estate and infrastructure that also has equitable outcomes for residents and communities of color. I'm proud of Vineshka's leadership on equity issues, pushing for businesses and workforce equity goals on all PDC transactions, properties, loans, its own PDC projects, and storefront and neighborhood projects. Through our work, as you know, we partner with PDC and work to help get more minority women contractors uh, on your projects. Uh, we've seen a result of this work as we're now connected with all the departments of PDC uh, in the agency in recent years. And we've had several no notable successes as a result of that. Uh, this, this year, uh, the Nelson parking lot projects being awarded to a minority uh, contractor, Raymore Construction, uh, 91st and Foster you just talked about. It was through some, frankly, some lessons learned on the Mercado project with uh, Bremick that Pat Weekly and I went back to them and said, you can do better. And out of the chute, they have at least selected at this point, and I believe that they will be under contract a minority uh, electrical contractor to do the electrical work. And I think they have a couple other firms in that minority electrical plumbing trade, which is always where we want to see more firms participate because that's where the dollars are. Folks can make a living wage and build wealth. Um, we also have had some great success with your storefront neighborhood projects where we've been able to get some contractors in for the first time to work with PDC on PDC projects as a contractor fulcrum construction that actually has bid some other projects and hasn't been successful, but it's been successful in storefront and neighborhood. And now they're getting an opportunity 
to be familiarized with the PDC team. So hopefully down the road, they will continue to grow as a contractor and have an opportunity to do more work. And they're a Hispanic woman-owned contractor. So we really appreciate that how one voice in leadership combined with the commitment of the staff can make a difference and make it happen. So MCIP and I personally wish Ineska the best of luck in her future work. And I want to urge PDC to continue its focus in leadership and, as a, and ensure on its other developments, on your future developments, that you make sure that they continue to benefit longtime residents and communities of color in the neighborhoods that have had this invest, investment. We want to make sure we keep the balance and we minimize gentrification or eliminate it if possible as much as possible. We encourage you to make sure that your dollars are distributed equitably to minority and women owned businesses and minority and women workers. We really appreciate your work with the community, and we appreciate your work with community-based organizations to help make all this work happen, like our organization, MCIP, and NAMAC Oregon that represents minority contractors. So we really appreciate your effort and your leadership, Aneshka, and the PDC Commission and staff, and we want to thank you very much. Thank you. So um, Charles Wilhoyt couldn't be here today, but I have a nice piece here that he wrote to read. And this is actually farewell to Patrick and Ineska from Charles. You have both contributed greatly to the face and health of our city. Rest assured that the public applauds you for being so creative and so gritty. Yes, there have been challenges, but you face them all head on. And I can say with certainty that any detractors should now be long gone. For if they look up and down our streets, near an area did you not touch, and as we reflect on it today, you truly did accomplish so very, very much. Office buildings and colleges, community centers, the tram, and more than one park, hotels and condos, apartments and waterfront lighting for after dark. From the Timbers to the Thorns to the Winterhawks to the Blazers, Bud Clark Commons, the Tillicum Crossing, and bike paths for nature gazers, Startups and storefronts and a host of community, community and economic advances, grants and loans, often providing first and unique development chances. The Mercado, Bioswells, historical uh, markers, Airport Way and Killingsworth Station, all of these and more have made our city an envy of the entire nation. Yes, your touch has been expansive, your impact meaningful and real, so no one should ever question the intent of your every deal. With a talented staff of professionals and committed partners at your side, your mission was always singular, to develop a city that fills us all with pride. And though I'm very sorry to be unable to deliver my farewell face to face, know that as you leave PDC, you have made our city an infinitely better place. Thanks very much for your commitment and for sharing us your valuable time. Though not present, though not present I can hear Chair Kelly's timer beeping. So going on would be a PDC crime. <laughs> okay, is there anyone else who wants to say a few words about Aneshka? I, I would like to say a few words. Heck. Um, so this, the real reason why I actually decided to resign when I did is that I didn't think I could serve on uh, this organization without Aneshka on the board. So I, I knew I had to leave when, an, when, an, when Aneshka did. But, I, but truly, my entire time as executive director has been um, serving while Aneshka has been on the board. And so I do feel, in some sense, like our, like our paths have been tied together. And, and, and it's been part of what's made my time here wonderful is, is serving with you. Everybody's covered all the, obviously, all the incredible contributions, and I, and I second all of that. You, you've had to fill, and I, you know, I, I think it's a bit of a critique, you've had to fill many roles on this board, and I hope in the future boards that's not all placed on one person. But you've, you've filled all those ro roles admirably, and you've, and you've represented a lot of interests. Um, uh, and I think that um, deserves a, a lot of a, a lot of admiration. Um, I I know that this, as as Scott mentioned, I know that you know it uh, it takes a lot to serve on this board. Uh, it's a volunteer role, and you have as busy a life as anyone, and and so you deserve uh, 
deserve the, the opportunity to take a break, but I hope that you will continue to serve in leadership roles in the future. The city needs needs you uh, to, to to serve, and so I know that maybe as I have older kids, so I can attest it it, it does get a little. Easy. There's a, my wife's here. It gets a little. Well, it gets a, maybe maybe a few more years. It gets a little easier, but um, there'll be opportunities to serve, and I hope I hope you do continue to serve. Um, and um, I'll be happy to serve with you if the opportunity comes along. But thank you, thank you, Aneska. Thank you so much. Um, I just <sighs> overwhelmed right now. Um, it. It has been a roller coaster ride of emotions, this PDC journey. Um, I, I think Scott Anders, he really expressed how difficult of a, of a position this can be. Um, and to just make it to the end, I mean, literally, it was like starting to be a countdown for me because I just, I, I am not making it. <laughs> um, my three children, they're, they're growing and their activities have increased and the company's growing and it just, so it has been really difficult to be able to, to manage um, everything and I have a tremendous amount of support and so I'm so thankful for all of that because without that I really wouldn't be able to be here at all. And that support includes the PDC staff which has just from day one been so receptive of me and just so kind and always willing and able to explain anything and everything that I've needed. Um, and that's from Executive Director Quinton to my previous chair, um, Scott Andrews, and my previous board members. I've been with eight male board members <laughs> over the course of uh, my six years here. So they've been a tremendous amount of support and encouragement for me. And um, I've just, I've never felt like I was an outsider in the group. And that part has, is just, it's huge and it's important and we as women need to continue to, you know, take on these roles and Faye, who's gonna be taking the executive director role shortly, um, we, we need to have the support of our fellow women leaders as well as the males around us and, and I've definitely received that here. So um, with that, I just, I'm also, I, I don't like to overly talk about myself. It makes me really uncomfortable, but um, it, it has been really an honor to, to serve on this board. It's stretched me out of my comfort zone, which is to be very private. I mean, I still don't have a Facebook account, and I, you know, I don't like sharing a lot about my personal life and being in the public and, you know, having negative press. Oh my gosh, that was really awful. And so um, to really be stretched out of my comfort zone, but to do so, to help kind of push the mission of what I really believe the city can be is, is one of the greatest cities in the world. And it's kind of what I was charged with when I met with um, former mayor um, Sam Adams when he thought, you know, I think you'd be great on this board. And I thought, well, if it means serving my city and doing something better for my city, then, then I'll do it. And I think at the time I said I was looking forward to seeing cranes in the sky and shovels in the ground. And um, that definitely has happened in a huge way. And I just want that the, uh, the benefits of the cranes and the shovels in the ground to continue to be spread equally amongst all Portlanders. And so I, I really hope that that's my legacy on, on this board is that I, I help to just push those topics a little further and, and, um, and I'm, I'm proud of that, and I'm just proud of all the great work that other people are gonna continue to do. The new commissioner that's gonna be taking my role, I wish you all the best success moving forward, and if you ever wanna meet with me, just because you have any other questions, I'll be available to you. I'm just down the block. So thank you all so much. This was just really sweet. Golly, that's a, the longest clap I've ever heard in this place. Um, it's my honor to uh, read this resolution in your honor, Aneska. Um, this is resolution 7198, and then commissioners were going to vote on it. Um, whereas Aneska Dixon was appointed as a member of the Portland Development Commission by Mayor Sam Adams and confirmed by the City Council effective July 19, 2006. 
whereas Aneska Dixon has served with honor and distinction as a champion of neighbor, neighborhood economic development strategy, whereas Aneska Dixon was instrumental in providing leadership, guidance, and resources on many efforts, especially contracting opportunities for minority and women subcontractors and prime contractors, whereas Aneska Dixon has served as a PDC audit committee li liaison since 2008, the most exciting committee at PDC, <laughs> providing oversight to PDC's financial reporting, internal controls, and audits. During her service, PDC consistently received a clean audit opinion from external auditors and earned their Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association, which PDC has now earned for 28 years. Whereas Inesca Dixon has been the youngest individual ever, ever to serve as a PDC commissioner. That's a pretty cool honor. Whereas Aneska Dixon has frequently deployed her professional skills as a small business owner to guide PDC through complex development transactions with a careful eye on how those deals would benefit the community at large, particularly the minority and women contracting community. Whereas Aneska Dixon volunteers significant time away from her family and her business to ensure PDC's mission and vision for the city would be achieved, Whereas Aneska Dixon has ably represented the City of Portland as Vice Chair and Commissioner of the PDC here in Portland and across Oregon. And whereas Aneska Dixon has diligently and forthrightly carried out her civic duties on behalf of PDC in the best interests of, interest of the city. Now therefore, be it resolved that PDC individually and collectively commends Aneska Dixon for Dixon for her service to PDC and to the constituency of the City of Portland that PDC represents, and be it further resolved that this resolution shall become effective immediately upon its adoption. And with that. And I just have one correction. It wasn't July 19th of 2006. I haven't been here that long. It was. Uh, I was surprised at that. <laughs> yeah, no, it was 2010, I believe. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay. Can the record be so corrected? So, I would be honored to make a motion to approve res resolution number 7198 to recognize Aneshka Dixon's service. Thank you. I'd be equally honored to second it. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. The motion carries. One more round of applause. Thank you. now for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. I just appreciate that more than you could know. Okay. Our next uh, business is an acknowledgement of our um, outgoing director, Patrick Quinton. So, um, you know, first of all, I guess my, my own remarks, um, it, you know, I, I knew Patrick just a little bit before I came onto the commission uh, from serving on some committees that Sam Adams, Adams had going and so on. Um, and, you know, you never quite know um, what, what an individual is going to be like. And, and uh, it didn't take me very long um, to understand that I was working with somebody who was capable, um, smart, um, all those kinds of things that you would expect. Um, but it was interesting over this time to, to, to really see how much he just cared about our community and sincerely, and that he really was in, much more invested in um, the work than I would have ever thought. Um, and I think that's probably in general true for me about the whole PDC staff, and everybody is just com tremendously committed people, but you know, the, that often is, is inspired by the leadership at the top. So. Um, I, I have gained a greater amount of respect for Patrick and uh, think that he has uh, done a tremendous job 
um, when, you know, those cranes in the air, um, I'd give them a little credit for anyway. Uh, I know the mayor will, would. Um, I shouldn't say that a lot of credit. Uh, so so um, it's, you know, it's been, I mean, the only thing I have trouble I have with Patrick is, is that he's decided to leave, you know. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> created a little bit of a challenge in all of our lives. But other than that, um, thank you for your work and your service to our city. And uh, I think you can leave with uh, your head held very, very high um, and go on to the next thing in your life. So I will uh, now ask the other commissioners to make a comment or two. Well, I would just say it's hard to, hard to uh, top that. I share uh, Chair Kelly's feelings about Patrick. Um, I'm just very, very impressed with your skills and your devotion to this job and this agency. You've done a fantastic job. I've really enjoyed getting to know you personally as well. And uh, I would just say that I'm really excited to see what you do next. And I'm hoping that you will continue your efforts on behalf of our city in a very engaged way. So thanks so much. I had a chance to work with you as a customer as well as on this side of the table. That's right. And uh, the one term that comes to mind me right away is integrity. Uh, you know, I really admire you and, and the integrity you bring to this commission, to our city, and everything I've watched you do over the years. Um, you know, you're a very, very straight shooter. Um, you know, your, your communication is tremendous. It's very easy to work with you. Um, I suspect there's probably more than just me that might have given a second thought to saying yes to a mayor uh, if we'd known that you were leaving. Um, uh, candidly, the, the confidence that you bring to me and the topics that your staff, which um, is a direct tribute to you, the staff that you've built, um, gives me a lot of confidence in, in making a, a quick vote. Um, I noticed what I presumed was your wife walking in because she looked at you a little differently than the rest of the staff does. <laughs> um, so. But I also have to say, and Aneshka, the same thing, you know, the, the, the uh, sacrifices that you make um, to make this organization as successful as it is and to build the staff that you've built and to make the contributions you've made to the city, it, it takes a team. Um, and your wife and your, your ch kids should be very, very proud of what you've accomplished in this city. It is hard to go around a corner, Patrick, without seeing the impact that you've had. Um, and while it's controversial at times, and you faced very challenging times with the downsizing, the economy, um, the impact that you've had has been absolutely tremendous. Um, I, like, likewise, am very um, um, excited uh, to watch the rest of your career. Um, I, I might have a, an amendment to the resolution, and that would be you have to stay here in Portland. Um, I guess and, kids already passed that. <laughs> and I look forward to what you, uh, your further contributions are to the city. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> this is a tough day here. Um, I just think what I love about Patrick is that he's one of those people that stays calm in pretty much any and every situation and like, well, at least with no, us. <laughs> Maybe your staff has a different uh, perspective on that. But with, with us, with the board members, with the president, when he's in the public, when he's speaking to others, um, just really keeping this kind of even level of calmness to the point where we have gone through so many ups and downs in the agencies and really, really difficult times that he, you know, early on when he came on as executive director had to tackle just immediately. And, you know, not only was everything falling apart financially, st his staff was being reduced. He had to change policies coming, you know, straight, I mean, within like, I feel like you got a week of a, you know, kind of getting orientation and bam, it was just everything was kind of thrown at him. And he works so much. Like, that's one of the things that I think a lot of people, you know, aren't aware of is that when you are an agency like this, you're expected to be everywhere all the time, including on weekends and after hours and you're traveling and you're away from your family and your home. And it's a huge personal sacrifice. But he just stayed calm, ran the course, did what he needed to do, kind of kept his eye on the objectives of what he was going after with that real, like, strong economic development spirit that he had and continues to have. And 
um, just he has been so impressive to, to be able to, to watch over the course of you know each year and see, okay, what's Patrick, what's he gonna do this year? What's his plan this year? And he, he sticks with it every year. He keeps his eye on the objective and he, he pushes it forward. And he's also one of those people that he doesn't just let people tell him what to do, you know? And this is a really, this is one of those, well, this is one of those agencies where, you know, you are, there is a lot of political strategy that you have to do behind everything. And I think he does a fantastic job, but he also stands his ground. He stands behind his values and what he believes in. And, you know, that's, that's the mark of a great leader to me. So I just, I am so glad that he's leaving the same day that I'm leaving. And, um, and I, you know, again, the next person that takes his role, they have really large shoes to fit as well. And um, just thank you so much for, for all that you've given and, and your family has, has had to sacrifice and be part of that. I mean, he doesn't always, he's not always well favored in the press and that's not fun. And it's, it can be a really thankless job. And, um, he, he's done a lot of great work. We hear about it every single month at these meetings. I mean, the tremendous amount of work that we have done, that's, that's very commendable. And, you know, we should definitely get more press towards that. But he continued to push forward, and, and congratulations. You deserve a, a break as well. <laughs> uh, thank you, Patrick, for all the leadership that you've shown all of us as, as, in Hopefully, uh, the staff has picked up from uh, your example, and uh, we will be in good hands uh, with Faye stepping in to fill your shoes in the interim. Um, the integrity and professionalism that you address everything uh, from you know every resolution that comes before us uh, is professionally presented to us in a way that we rarely have questions when staff actually comes before us. Um, Really appreciate uh, everything that you've done to make this uh, an, an easy an easy volunteer job. So, thank you. Okay, we uh, have uh, Scott Andrews uh, first to come up and say a few more words again, and then Carmen Rubio. Chair Kelly. Executive Director Quinton, commissioners, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I can't believe that it's been two years since I sat on the other side of the table. Um, and Patrick, uh, I actually didn't write something down because I couldn't figure out what to write, to tell you the truth. Um, I, I so enjoyed working with you for, for the time period. And um, I think back, uh, when Bruce Warner decided that he was going to retire, Sam and I got together and very quickly came to the conclusion that given the state of the economy and given that we were uh, just into a year or so of implementing this city strategic plan, that if we could find somebody within the existing executive staff um, that was up to the task, that we wouldn't lose any time in the process and it would be smooth sailing and we could keep going and it was really important because as I said, the economy was still really bad and we were getting some traction. And we looked at the executive staff at PDC and we said, oh, there's three or four people who we think who can run this, let's really dig into it. And we were criticized by some for not doing a national search, but you know, that's the way it goes. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, we found you and you weren't one of the three or four that we thought were capable of doing the job. <laughs> Came from a level even farther below. But frankly, what you have proven, and, and uh, I mean, I, I'm proud of what you've done. We could talk about project after project, initiative after initiative. Um, it's amazing what we've gone through, the, the layoffs, the changes in funding, the changes in mayors. Um, it goes on and on and on. But uh, your communication skills are outstanding. The integrity is um, um, unbelievable. Um, I couldn't tell you what to do either. Tom can't tell you what to do. The mayor can't tell you what to do. But you always have a good reason for doing <laughs> what you do. Um, and I think the, the results show it. So um, uh, thank you uh, for putting in the time and effort. Um, I think the, the city was 
uh, we were lucky to be able to, to have you on the staff at a time, at a critical time in, in the economy. It's just so amazing to me how quickly we forget. Um, in 2008, September 2008, the stock market crashed. Um, we came close to, to uh, the worst depression in the history of the United States. And uh, it wasn't, I, I, I went to city council meetings um, where city council was moving budget items forward to create jobs in the community. I mean, it was that bad. I, I remember uh, Commissioner Mullis saying that they were seeing 35% uh, uh, unemployment in their industry and it got worse over time. And the impacts of that and on their families, um, it was just a, a difficult time. Um, and we're at the other end of the rainbow at this point and we need to enjoy it. Uh, so thank you, job well done. Um, enjoy the next chapter of your life and, and I, hope the, I hope to have the opportunity to work with you again in the future. Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, so Carmen is, is in traffic, but she sent her remarks over and I'm gonna read them, which I'm sure is gonna be an inadequate rendition, but at the end there's some Spanish and I, I'm gonna hand it to uh, chair, or to uh, vice chair, my vice chair to read that Spanish. Um, so, it's an honor for me to be here to share words about what Patrick's leadership and commitment to economic equity and opportunity has meant to all of us, as well as personally to me. I was trying to remember earlier when I first met Patrick, if, if I was still working for the city or if, it was already, if I was already at the Latino Network, and I couldn't remember. But I do remember the first conversation we really had was following the an Hispanic Heritage event, and I remember it because of the season and its meaning. And we talked about leaderships, our hope and vision for the city and holding true to one's true calling in life. These themes were evident in Patrick's leadership here at PDC. Despite starting during his, the midst of a rough recession, he and his team at PDC focused on developing a new kind of economic development plan, one that was rooted in helping the little guys and those historically excluded or displaced in the name of economic progress. Instead of using old school economic development strategies that resulted in clear winners and losers, Patrick and his team changed the institutional culture in order to create a new one by developing a, a, a game plan where economic development can make winners of all, of, of all stakeholders, particularly communities of color, East Portland neighborhoods, entrepreneurs, and startups. There is no better example of this in the, the Portland Mercado. This, Past spring marked the year anniversary of the Marcato in Lentz. I remember standing there for the opening day event as people from all different communities, sectors, and backgrounds crowded together to celebrate this collaboration that created economic opportunity while affirming the talent, culture, and richness of Portland's Latino community. Speaker after speaker thanked Patrick and PDC staff for their support of this complex project. As someone who works with families who are pushed to the margins uh, in this county and, and also as someone who myself has often felt the invisibility of my community in the decision-making halls of government, I was proud to be a Portlander that day. I per personally will miss his leadership style, which is understated yet so direct. I've learned a few leadership lessons myself from him, chiefly. It's not all that complicated. Think long-term. Never be afraid to go all in, and she says in parentheses, poker reference. <laughs> Being strategic is very important, but doing it with integrity is most important. I've learned a lot from Patrick in his work here, but also in the community. He is incredibly supportive outside of work for organizations and causes he believes in. We notice this about char characters of our civic business and government leaders, and it says and means a lot. Thank you, Patrick, for being such an important part of Portland's story. Thank you for seeing all of us that live in this community and having both a vision and practicality to turn that economic opportunity advancement so that no one has to be left behind. We will miss your leadership here at PDC, but your legacy is here and your talented and capable colleagues. I know in your next true calling, you will do it with the same amount of vision and passion for our beloved community that you have here. Okay. Now you.
All right, so my mom will get mad if I screw this up because she's fluent in Spanish, but I will try here. Um, hasta que nos encontremos de nuevo, muy, muy buen amigo. Until we see you next time, my dear friend. Gracias, Carmen Rubio. Thanks. Let's give Patrick a little hand on that one. Uh, So do we have, uh, we have Angela Jackson on the phone? Call her. How long will it take to get her on? Should we get some? We're sorry. It is <laughs> We're calling this number. So why we are, while we are trying to make that connection, is there anybody else who would like to say a few words about Patrick? Oh, come on. Here we go. This is Angela. Angela, this is the Portland Development Commission meeting, and uh, we're welcoming you to say a few words about Patrick Quentin. Well, thank you for letting me weigh in. Uh, can you hear me OK? We can hear you OK. Okay, perfect. Patrick, I just want to commend your service uh, to the city and to PDC. In particular, our experience with you uh, helping to start Portland Seed Fund was, uh, it really changed my expectations about what was possible within city government. And I wasn't biased against city government, but I just haven't ever seen anybody with the capacity to move around obstacles and make the difficult but worthwhile happen like you. So a couple of highlights. I'm actually calling in maybe a victim of your own success, Patrick. I have to miss your party because um, we are at our Portland Seed Fund eighth demo day. We have, we're celebrating 74 investments. Um, you helped us get off the ground by when this was barely an idea. And now we have had 11 positive exits where our companies have been acquired and returned capital back. We have created over 400 jobs with those companies. Uh, the $5 million that we've invested now over two funds has attracted an additional $125 million of capital uh, to Oregon, mostly to Portland, but to Oregon. Basically, that's a 25 to one return in terms of investing uh, in in our you know in our company, they are job creators. Six hundred when you count the indirect jobs, they are sort of leading the tech uh, the next tech wave. And Patrick, you really started that with helping facilitate that first PDC investment in Portland Seed Fund. Again, a novel and worthwhile idea. It would have been easier to say, we can't do this too hard. Um, but you, you had to hustle, and you did the, the hard thing that was worth doing. Um, and I've always admired you for that. I've also admired the way you trained up your team to learn and follow in that mold. Um, I also admire the way that your team listened rather than just came in with a plan. I think in that way, you earned the respect and the trust of that startup community. So this is your day. You have so much to be proud of. And I'm just glad I was able to, uh, with Portland Seed Fund, play a small part in your career. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Angela. So unless there's anyone else who wants to say a few words, I'm going to read the resolution. Uh, Jillian, I thought you might come up. Did I get some comments? Pardon me? Do I have some mic time, too? Uh, no. <laughs> yes, you can have some time. Chair and Commission, uh, I'll back up for a moment. I, I have been behind the pillar and heard all the great words about Commissioner Dixon and would deliver my personal as well as the mayor's thank you. We really can't thank you enough. 
Um, Patrick, <laughs> it's really been a, a personal pleasure to get to work with you. Um, you know, you're someone who is extremely uh, principled. Your positions are well-founded. Uh, you know, it has stretched my thinking and my own, you know, sense of, of confidence to have um, conversations with you about how we move important projects forward. I know the mayor is incredibly appreciative of, of what he would call just what you've delivered. Um, you know, it's not just talk, it's not just plans. Uh, it are things that have made a real difference in the physical nature of the city, which is a passion of the mayor. Um, but you have greatly expanded his appreciation and, and people's ability to participate in um, prosperity. And the, the process that you and Kimberly Branham led to update the, the five-year plan, I think, was a real opportunity for everyone at that table to see your leadership, to see you attend to all of the people in our community and how PDC can serve them. Yes, you've left us with a problem to solve. <laughs> huh. And so that's been keeping me busy. Uh, but it has, it really, it really has been a pleasure and we really do thank you very much for all of your years at PDC, but especially those as executive director. Thanks, Jillian. Okay, Patrick, you can say a few things. <laughs> well, um, yeah, like Ineska, it's, it's, um, it's, it's tough to put in words. Um, appreciation for everything. I, I really appreciate all the kind words from everybody. I especially appreciate the uh, words from the board. I, I, you know, I've said this before, and I do repeat this when you're not around. I, you know, people often hear different characterizations of boards, organizations with boards, and what it's like to work with boards. Working with this board and, and obviously the, 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 the board before this has, true, has been one of the pleasures of this job. I consider this to be one of the great assets of this organization, that it has an, an incredibly talented, even though volunteer, but incredibly talented, dedicated board. It, it really helps make PDC what it is. It, it, it strengthens the effectiveness of this organization. It's what makes, it's, it's the independent part of the organization that really, I think, works. And, and so I, I really do want to start by thanking all of you and, and John Mollis and, and Charles Wilhoyt and even Steve Strauss. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Steve was, uh, uh, you know, he pushed our thinking as well. But it, it's, it's, it's really, it's, 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 like I said, I think it's, it's a special part of this organization. And, and, um, uh, and I know that Alicia will, will carry on the, the tradition. I, I want to particularly just, just thank um, Tom and, and Scott. You know, people love write about uh, the PDC and the PDC executive director and you work for the mayor and I worked for Tom Kelly and I worked for Scott Andrews um, and and it was a it was definitely it was a it was a pleasure it was a privilege to work for the two of you I, I've, I've learned much and and I, I just when I talk once again when I talk about the board I talk about the fact that the two chairs I've had have been have been um, citizens of this city of the highest order people who give back in every single way over over long careers, and and for PDC to have the two of you serve in those roles, you know, during my time is I think is is pretty special. So I really appreciate, it. and I thank Scott for 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 giving me the opportunity for for looking outside of the the regular folks and, and taking a shot. Um, I also want to thank uh, Mayor Sam Adams uh, as well as, as as Mayor Charlie Hales. You know, Sam had to. Had to have the same level of confidence in me as well that, that Scott did, and and uh, and and so I really appreciate the the opportunity he gave me, and 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 then you know, Mayor Hills had every opportunity to go in a different direction, and I know that he seriously considered that when he came into office, and and it's to his credit, as Jillian just talked about, he really gave me a chance and gave me a chance to demonstrate that that we could we could implement his vision, but also you know I was able he gave me the chance to 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 uh, to sell him on some of the work that we were already doing that should be kept, and, and he, he, um, I was very supportive the whole way, as as Jillian said. So I very much appreciate that. I, you know, there's been some comments made here about the quality of the resolution. I mean, I don't do this. I mean, this is the stat. I mean, all these people in this room here are the people who do all the work in this agency. 
um, all the, you know, I, you know, you, you're the head of this, you get to take credit for it, but, but by no means um, do I really do any of the work. It's really done by all these great, this great staff, and it's always been, it's always been the, the true asset of PDC is the incredibly talented staff, and, and um, it, it does, it draws incredibly dedicated people who are here for the mission, who are here because this is what they believe in, and they give everything um, uh, to this job, and, and they've been through an incredibly difficult time just like I have, and so any decisions that, that, that we had to make while I was here, um, everybody bore the brunt of those decisions, and, and so, um, um, like I said, it's to their credit that this agency continued to perform and deliver the incredible things to, throughout this time period. I, I especially want to thank my leadership team. These are the people that I've you know, work most closely with, so we, you know, we've we've had to, to jointly kind of tackle some of these tough decisions, and and uh, we've learned to become an effective team and 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 gotten to know each other. And I, uh, well, and 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 I particularly want to recognize Kimberly Branham, who served as my deputy the entire time I've been here, and um, I, you know, I was able to 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 hand off so much of, of what had happened in this agency to her with complete and utmost confidence and, and uh, so many of the initiatives that people talked about today, um, even, even just the emphasis on, on, on equity in our work, she's, she really has been a leader in making that happen and I've learned so much from her and in, 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 in the importance of that in our work and then I wanna you know, so thank Faye and uh, you know, I, I have the utmost confidence in Faye and, and look forward to her three months, and, uh, but, but Faye's also been a trusted uh, advisor to me um, in ways that most people never see, um, and I think that's what makes her so effective. Um, I, I, I also have to just thank this person right here, Gina Wiedrich. She's been um, probably the person I've worked most closely with during my time here, and even before I became executive director, we've been, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe we're together too much, but, uh, but, but we seem to we seem to put up with each other. Uh, but Gina is a truly dedicated, like all the staff here. She's truly dedicated to this to this organization, to this mission. But um, um, she's made it possible for me to be to be so successful in my role, and and um, has taken on the role that she has now is is like double the size of what it was when she started in this position, and she she take stuff on and, and figures out how to get it done and does it with, uh, you know, with, with um, her own style and personality. So I will truly miss you, Gina, and I hope everybody here continues to be nice to Gina when I'm gone. Here. <laughs> just, people have made, have made mention um, uh, during their comments as well about the support of my, my family. My wife is here, and, and I mean, it's obvious. There's no way that that you can do this job without the support of of your 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 partner, your spouse, and and my family. I mean, and my my three kids. Let's see, I'm gonna. <laughs> um, we you talk about um, sacrifice, and and of course it's sacrifice. But but you know we look at it in our family as supporting each other, and she supports what I do, believes in what I do just like we support each other, and, and that's the way it's been. And so I, I have devoted a lot of my time to this, and, and, um, and there's ever been a question that, they, that there's been support there, so I truly thank you for, for being there for me. And I do hope that what happens next does allow me to be, to be um, more, more present and be more supportive of everything that, that my family does. Um, and, and, and I just wanna say, Really, that's not that's not the only example of this. Everybody's families and spouses, partners, and this organization, you know, from uh, staff in this organization, do the same. There's, I'm not the last person that walks out the door of this office every day. There's so many people who do the same, and they have people on the other side who understand the work we do. And and so it is. I think once again a testament to the character of this place. Um, and I know that. So, I have a little bit more to say. And I know I stand in the way of both, whatever refreshments are out there, but also Tom being able to gavel this meeting closed on time. Um, but it's too late now. But uh, <laughs> I do, I just want to, I just want to end with a few thoughts. I, I, as Scott said, we could revel in, a, in what's happened over the past five and a half years and, and, and there's slides going up and, and, and it's, it would be fun, but I, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, that what's the future for PDC and, and there's a lot of talk about the future of PDC and, and, and I think when people talk about it, it's, it's challenging 
because people try and define us in very particular ways and very simple narratives, right? People, it, it still bothers me to no end that the headlines in the paper say, Portland's urban renewal agency. We're not, we're not there. We're, we're, we do so much more than that. Or this whole debate about we're about placemaking and now we're about job creation and we're back to placemaking. Or, you know, we're too independent or we're too political or, or even the disparaging comments that, are, that, that singularly blame us for things like gentrification or for, for enriching downtown developers. You know, I, obviously there's, there's so much about that, those, these narratives that just aren't true. But, but the other part of it is they just, they fail to, to take the time to recognize what I use in, in a wonky way, the duality of our work, but the nuance to our work. We intentionally operate in what I think of as the uncomfortable middle of, of often opposing worldviews in, in this city. Um, you know, we're the bridge between the public sector and the private sector. We're, we're the implementation arm in a city that loves process. We are the development arm in a city that loves to plan. We are legally, you have a legally empowered board here that can make its own decision and yet we report to the mayor. Um, and as long as I've been here, Peter was here 15 years ago, even longer, we've always been about placemaking and job creation and community economic development and every, I mean, everything you can talk about, we've always been that way. It's been people on the outside who tried to put us in these boxes. And so I, I think we're most effective when we are difficult to define, when, when, you know, when we actually resist the narrative and we embrace the discomfort of being in this, in this kind of middle area. And, and I think our strategic plan, which was just brought up, Jillian brought up, is a perfect example of that. We started that plan a year ago, basically the height of the recovery, as Scott mentioned, we, the, the Portland economy is being recognized around the US for being one of the best performing economies, job creation, sustained growth. We could have easily decided at that moment that we were gonna take a victory lap. It was time for us to say, hey, look at us, we job well done. We crafted a new five-year business pl uh, strategic plan that, that said, this isn't working. This economy is flawed. There are too many people being left behind. We're leaving behind uh, communities of color. We're leaving behind people in different parts of the city. And so we did the uncomfortable thing of going back and reinventing our work. And now we're in the process of, of doing that. That's not doesn't fit the simple narrative. That isn't the way that people like to talk about us, but we embrace that. And furthermore, we embrace the discomfort at the same time as that we're gonna address these disparities, we, we embrace the discomfort of acknowledging our racist past and, and the path that we need to take to become an anti-racist institution. Um, once again, it's not the way that people talk about us, um, but it's the way that we do our best work. Um, and then Peter and I just sat here and said, we need to embrace the discomfort of being an agency that does financial return and social benefit, right? And it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that once again, won't get talked about. But this is the way that we need to do, we need to do our work. Um, and I'll just end with a story from just the other night. I was, I've had a chance to meet with a lot of people who've reached out to me since I made my announcement and, and, and it's a lot of the same conversation and, and people, you know, this person said to me, I bet you're not gonna miss all the negative stories that get written about you or written about PDC. And I said, you know, for every negative story that gets written, we probably hear 10 to 20 personal testimonials to us, one-on-one, -on -one, that talk about how we've changed businesses, we've changed lives, we've made a difference. Um, so that's, my narrative of PDC, and I will miss that. I will miss that hearing those stories. It, it, it more than makes up for anything that's, that's written about us or that um, incorrectly defines us. Um, and I hope that that's what sustains everyone here um, in doing this work. Um, as I've said in multiple emails since I've announced this, my, my departure, um, I, I look forward to watching all the wonderful work that this agency is gonna do um, I'm, I'm a resident of the city, My, you know, we're not going anywhere, we're, we're, we're stay here, and I look forward to, to benefiting from the great work of this city. Um, this is truly, this is truly unique and amazing agency. Um, I, am, I am very sad to go, looking forward to other, to what comes next. 
Um, but I truly appreciate this, this wonderful opportunity and, and the opportunity to do this great work and get to be with this great team of people every single day. So thank you. OK, um, let's give the guy a hand. Huh? <laughs> Okay, we've got a resolution to read, and you can give him another hand. So, whereas Patrick Quinton was appointed as executive director of the Portland Development Commission on February 23rd, 2011, whereas Patrick Quinton announced plans to leave PDC on June 8th, 2016, whereas Patrick Quinton has served with honor and distinction as author of, author of the City of Portland's five-year economic development strategy, which helped Portland emerge from the worst recession in more than 60 year, years and created more than 40,000 new jobs and attracted more than, there's so many zeros here, I'm not sure, but I think it's a billion dollars, um, in new private investment. Whereas Patrick Quinton led PDC and its efforts to inclusive entrepreneurship, including the Portland Seed Fund, Startup PDX Challenge, and the Inclusive Startup Fund. Whereas Patrick Quinton led the PDC in its efforts in equity, including the PDC Equity Council, and always ensured the PDC staff consider who benefits from PDC investments. Whereas Patrick Quinton led the PDC in efforts in redevelopment, including the acquisition of the United States Post Office site, the development of the Portland Mercado, and investment of the, in the Lentz Town Center, whereas Patrick Quinton has provided dynamic, forward-thinking, and thoughtful counsel to the PDC leadership team, the PDC Board of Commissioners, and to all the PDC employees who sought his advice as PDC conduct, conducted its work on behalf of the citizens of Portland. Whereas Patrick Quinton has served on the boards of Greater Portland Inc., Oregon Story Board, and the Portland Business Alliance, Whereas Patrick Quinton has brought a tremendous sense of professionalism and collaboration to PDC, where he is highly regarded by his colleagues. Whereas Patrick Quinton has earned the admiration and respect of the PDC board and staff for his dedication, enthusiasm, and hard work. Whereas Patrick Quinton has ably represented the city as executive director of PDC here in Oregon, across the nation, and internationally. And whereas Patrick Whitten has diligently and forthrightly carried out his civic duties on behalf of the PDC and the best interest of the city, now therefore it be resolved that the PDC individually and collectively commends Patrick Quinton for his service to PDC, to the constituency of the city of Portland that PDC represents, and be it further resolved that this resolution sh shall become effective immediately upon its adoption. Do I hear a motion? I would love to do my last motion here. So um, yes, I definitely move this resolution. Thank you, Commissioner. A second? I second the motion. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Let's give the guy another hand. <laughs> I'm supposed to say that there's goodies in the lobby and the, we are adjourned. Oh, thank you. A long meeting.